happy morning to one and all a hearty welcome to you all for the national webinar on new education policy 2020-20 organized by central university of tamil nadu the secret of getting ahead is getting started the secret of getting started is breaking the complex overwhelming task into small manageable tasks and then starting on the first one Central University of Tamil Nadu started its first attempt of sensitization sensitization on new education policy 2020-20. Let us all rise for Tamil Nadu world. Professor of Tapu Kumar Abhishek to start the program with e lighting. In all the positions he holds, he set a benchmark for the followers. He proved as an admirable administrator, as a person who works in an organized and active way towards the goal. He stood as a courageous pioneer by executing all the tasks which he performed as perfect. Reminds him as perfect pioneer with good number of publication. He is a renowned researcher in the field of education, being an instrumental to many students. He is noted as a strong motivator. By his lively and application-oriented speeches, he reaches by people as an orator. By producing many scholars in the field of education, he is world-famous academician. As a head dean, director, vice chancellor, he left his new initiative to, which shows he is a good initiator. More than all of this, by his care and concern towards all levels of people, he stands as a role model for human beings. We proudly invite our Kesavada Professor or Kapoor Kumar Vinsar, Vice Chancellor Acting, for his welcome and presidential address. Very good morning to all of you. Honorable Chancellor of the Central University of Tamil Nadu, Badma Bhushan, Professor G. Badmanabhan, distinguished speakers of today's national webinar, Professor Manishankar. Vice Chancellor Bharat Dasan University, Badmasti Professor Tari, former Vice Chancellor Pondicherry Central University, Professor K Muttuchaliyan, former Vice Chancellor Periyar University, Professor Shiva Subramanian, former Vice Chancellor Bardiyar University, Professor Vargis, Vice Chancellor National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration, New Delhi. and professor panjanathan vice chancellor tamil nadu teacher education university members of the executive council court and academic council of the central university of tamil nadu deans heads of the departments faculty members staff students members of the public 
friends from the media ladies and gentlemen it's my proud pleasure and privilege to extend heartiest welcome to you to this national webinar on the implications of national policy and education 2020 for the various stakeholders i feel extremely honored by the virtual presence of our most respected chancellor padma bhushan professor g padmanabhan for this national webinar for inauguration it's a matter of great pleasure for all of us that he could find time to be with us amidst his hectic schedules this shows his keen interest and deep involvement in the continued developmental activities of the central university of tamil nadu mr chancellor your presence here this morning is a source of inspiration for all of us and i extend a very warm welcome to you on this great occasion welcome i am very happy to extend a very warm welcome to a galaxy of former and present vice chancellors who represent central universities state universities and private universities who will enlighten us the various dimensions of the new education policy in diversified perspectives from different angles it's my proud privilege to extend a great welcome to the outstanding academicians who have kindly consented to share their reflections amidst their very busy schedules i welcome you all sir i feel honored to welcome our own family members of central university of tamil nadu stakeholders of the central university of tamil nadu for joining us in this timely and significant webinar on the implications of national policy and education 2020 i am sure the deliberation should be of immense use in understanding the salient futures of the national policy and education and also in its effective implementation to fine tune our educational system in general and our university system in particular in accordance with the national goals and national priorities as laid down in the national policy on education this webinar as you know focuses on a very timely theme which will penetrate virtually in all areas of our day to day operations the objective of the webinar is to enable all the stakeholders of indian higher education system benefit from the understanding of the drastic reforms made in the new education policy which is very essential for all of us to calibrate ourselves in the various dimensions of higher education this webinar will also contribute and help us in identifying effective ways of translating this policy into perspective this is the most important thing which i would like to stress because we always find a gap between the policy and practice and such a webinar will go a long way in effective dissemination and contribute to for the translation of the policy into practice especially at the grassroots level and ultimately for the transformation of indian higher education to greater heights relevant for the needs of the 21st century as we all know the central university of tamil nadu has celebrated its decennial anniversary completion of 10 years last year over the past 11 years the central university of tamil nadu has been a pioneer and has made a big achievement of having secured the 11th rank among the universities of the state level in the 2020 ranking of the university this present national webinar is certainly a wonderful addition in our calendar of significant events for this year if you take a look at this webinar program you will agree that this national webinar 
is going to be thought provoking and very productive as well. It's a wonderful occasion for all of us to make, I should say, an academic rainbow today by bringing together excellent experts come vice chancellors from different types of universities so that we can realize together the manifold dimensions of new education policy with a 360 degree perspective from all angles. Such a big event would have confined within the four walls had it been organized in a face-to-face -face mode in a traditional seminar type. Thanks to COVID-19, I should say, there is a paradigm shift from seminar to webinar, which reaches the unreached, including the general, general public, providing an interface among academicians, policy makers, and stakeholders. With these few words, I would like to record my sincere thanks to all my colleagues in Central University of Tamil Nadu in organizing the first ever national webinar on new education policy by a central university in South India. With these words, I welcome you all once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. We are much pleased by your work. It is easy to run to others, so hard to stand on one's own record. It is easier to donate a few thousands to charity and keep oneself noble and to base self-respect on personal standards of personal achievement. Yes, there is no substitute for competence. We are blessed to have a person who is known for his content competence, functional competence, technical competence, and more than all, for his leadership competence. It is a honor more than a pleasure to have our honorable Chancellor Sir, Padma Kushan, Professor Bhagavan Sir with us. Let me welcome you, Sir, for your inaugural address. Thank you. Uh, hope you can all hear me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Dr. Katpaga Kumarvel, distinguished Vice Chancellor acting of the Central University of Tamil Nadu, and uh, very distinguished uh, chancellors and vice chancellors and uh, former vice chancellors of many universities representing different sectors. It's a great pleasure and privilege for me to be inaugurating this uh, webinar. Uh, I want to congratulate Dr. Kumaravel for having this webinar on implication of the new education policy. It's very timely and uh, we cannot have a better array of speakers, a better array of experts than what he has been able to assemble. Uh, thank you and congratulations, Dr. Kumaravel for this initiative. I, I want to take only a few minutes on this. You know, the policy does talk about significantly about school education as well. So I will not be mentioning except to recognize without a good school education, there cannot be a good uh, higher education. And uh, one of the things in the policy seems to be that adding three more years to the kids in our preschool and so on. But I will confirm to the higher education. And there have been earlier reports, 1986, 92, and so on. Now, my perception looks very comprehensive. And if it can be implemented, you know, this is something fall in line with global uh, vision, you know, you all know about SDG 4, which said, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all by 2030. Whether it will be able to fall in line, you know, I think the policy is taking you towards, uh, towards that. As I said, I will mention a few points. 
First thing I see is there will be only one word, university. If you go through the report, you will see they would like to replace all these terms, unitary university, affiliating university, affiliating technical university. If it is implemented, all are going to disappear and there will be only one term, university. I don't know. I read Kasturi Rangan report earlier and I in fact wrote a letter to HRD because when they said there will be two types of universities, teaching university with some research and research universities. I don't like it. I told them, you know, this cannot, you cannot have uh, separating education or uh, teaching from research. There has to be, every university has to do teaching, every university has to do research. What extent of quality of research they are able to do depends on many factors. But I'm sure every university is aiming to reach the highest level of quality of research as well as teaching. So that was the point I was trying to make and I'm happy. This time you have only one university term with a very broad definition, which includes teaching, which includes research, which includes liberal arts. You know, many other uh, issues. Uh, for example, they say every university will be a multidisciplinary university. In fact, you know, it's not a very easy task. Uh, when they say multidisciplinary university, they mean to include uh, tradition, uh, you know, uh, all concerns about our India's heritage. Everything should be part. Liberal arts in, in a sense. Whether it is possible, in fact, I was wondering how should it be possible in a technical university to have uh, uh, to have this multidisciplinary. But then the report makes it clear. If you say, if you take agriculture, if you take uh, law, legal universities, if you take technical universities, what do they mean by multidisciplinarity? There I find, uh, you know, health university. For example, they say what we mean by multidisciplinary, I have understood that way, include also Ayush, Ayurveda, Yunani, etc., 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 which is not part of allopathic uh, tradition. So allopathic uh, tradition uh, doctors should also know something about traditional medicine, and traditional medicine people who study should also know about allopathy. But you know, this becomes a as a general knowledge is okay. But when it, today what is happening, you all know, I don't have to tell you, when uh, at the graduate level, what is the expectation? You want to go to higher, further education, postgraduate education and specialization, or you go look for a job. So far, job opportunity is concerned, perhaps it is okay that you are widely knowledgeable. That's okay. But, you know, as you go further, it's going to be very difficult it's a huge subject by itself. But now you have veterinary universities, you have fisheries, you have everything separate. Now, will they all become multidisciplinary universities? All of them at least related to agricultural sciences will be part. Is it possible? I, I, I think, you know, that they say they will set up some five role model universities like that. Maybe that will happen, but it's going to take a while for it to, for, for us to become multidisciplinary university. General universities, yes, it should be possible. But, you know, specialized professional universities to become multidisciplinary, even within their segment, even within their area, is not going to be easy, in my opinion. The other point I want to make is, uh, interestingly, this uh, report acknowledges the issues. You know, we will normally raise issues. Uh, what about implementation? The policy says a policy is as good as its implementation. That itself says. Similarly, we have had issue like uh, funding. Uh, research, when it comes to, we said at least 1% of GDP. Countries are 2%, 3%, 4%, and so on. At present, we are at 0.69%. The report acknowledges points, and yes, we are at that. That's what they say. But similarly, when you come to the education, it's only 4.3%. I think the, the goal is 
the fact that the report acknowledges hopefully you know there will be seriousness uh, in, in really making it true making it happen the other uh, i don't want to talk uh, very much there are a few more issues uh, one or two i want to highlight the issue has been for example drilling with university grants commission as you know men vice chancellor or vice chancellor and you know the problems i used to be a commission member decades ago when yashpal was the chairman i remember you know universities the vice chancellor the registrar big team will come and make big presentations but the ugc has already decided you are a 1 crore university or a 1.5 crore university then i used to tell the chairman why are you troubling them you know they have precious time to waste you call them all here and then say you are this you are that the basket is already decided i hope things have changed i don't know i am talking about decades ago you know but the relevance of what i am saying is is it regulation funding all these can be separated that is what the policy says the policy states about four verticals funding will be separate regulation will be separate uh, 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 outcome is separate and uh, um, uh, curriculum standard is separate that means there are four verticals so this is going to be they say each one will be independent funding is not dependent on probably performance it can't be but there will be independent committee that means you are not threatened saying you know money is what we won't release money if you don't do, do this this because each one is going to be separate but at the same time they will see there will be integration between all these four verticals i don't know how it will be done it's going to be difficult because setting standards for example setting curricula there are professional the icir has its own similarly you know every iaict has its own they say this will be now done by general education uh, committee gec but they say they, they will become members of gec now if you, all these are become members the how big is going to be this gec how many gec should be there because there are areas as i mean these are all probably as you go along you are all in the field so you will be able to discuss with the uh, ministry etc and see how to fine tune this policy i am a researcher basically therefore i was you know earlier there was this issue uh, some of you may know <coughs> national research foundation national research foundation like us uh, research foundation uh, but there was a conflict between what uh, they said and what finance minister announced she said the funding of other agencies like dst dae dbt icmr icar will all be integrated and be operated by national research foundation and that to create a furor i wrote also saying no, this is not fair you know these agencies are already funding you cannot interfere with that now this report makes it very clear these agencies will continue to fund they will not whereas national research foundation will really help universities to foster research they will not take the role of dst they will not take the role of dbt they will not take the role of department of atomic energy etc but they will concentrate on university research how to support them so that means it becomes very clear it's not uh, the funding is not going to be this one ultimately i do not know uh, whether the kind of funding that would be needed will be enormous uh, for this kind of uh, approach and i do hope uh, this is possible and the only last point i want to make is the various committees whether it is has to be implemented it has to be the ministry of human resource development it, it has to be k c a b e it has to be state university it has to be the union government it has to be related ministries this has to be the state boards ntas <clears throat> these are all mentioned in the report itself that there has to be coordination 
how how effective will this coordination be i do not know probably it can happen it will take time but only one point i want to make we were close they give lot of powers to board of governors they mentioned clearly board of governors will decide including leadership positions will be decided by board of governors although they will be supported by <coughs> by experts board of governors seems to be the ultimate authority that means there may not be a, a political interference that is the objective of the education policy therefore i believe there are several aspects of uh, this educational policy which are really in my opinion very good if it can be implemented and people actually on the ground they will have the responsibility to delineate to discuss to understand and there must be several strategies to uh, modify fine tune there will be need requirements i again want to congratulate dr kumar vel for this webinar and thank you all for participating in this uh, webinar Uh, you have to excuse me. I have to leave at twelve thirty. I will be here at twelve thirty. I have to go to the hospital. I am taking this call from my house. I will drive down to the institute. There is a meeting at one. So you will kindly excuse me because this is a free meeting coming, and I would be very grateful if a uh, summary of the final recommendations, if I can get the same. Thank you so much. I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Great by your words. May I request our esteemed Vice Chancellor Acting, Professor Karpaka Kumar Vel Sir, to pay our gratitude to our Honorable Chancellor and introduce the first speaker of the day. Sir, thank you, sir. Chancellor Sir, for your very thought-provoking inauguration, and Professor Badmanabhan, our Chancellor, is an iconic figure, the tallest scientist. who needs a introduction no introduction he is an internationally renowned scientist he is an awardee of shanti swarup bhatnagar prize for science and technology in the year 1983 padma shri award in 1991 padma bhushan award in 2003 and was elected fellow of national academy of medical sciences and such an internationally renowned scientist i am happy to record here that he belongs to tanjavur district of tamil nadu and it is our fortune that we have him such an erudite figure as our chancellor and we are very fortunate to have his inspiring words uh, to inaugurate this national webinar i on my own behalf and on behalf of all the Stakeholders of the Central University of Tamil Nadu extend our profound sense of gratitude to the Chancellor. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And now, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Professor Manishankar and. Before introducing Professor Manishankar to the participants of this webinar, I just make a quick ice-breaking introductory remarks about the national policy on education. Historically, after independence, we had the report of Dr. Radha Krishnan's University Education Commission report in the year 1948-49. the report from the then vice chancellor of the university of madras dr lakshma sarandeliyas secondary education commission report in the year 1952-53 then the third report from the chairman of the then chairman of ugc dr d s kothari known as education commission report in the year 1964-66 then we had the national policy on education 
then the 42nd constitutional amendment then 1976 education was brought in concurrent list and the national policy in education in the year 1986 and the national policy in education 1986 modified in 1992 through a program of action in 1992 then we had the TSR Subramanian committee report on 27th May 2016 and the present new education policy 2020 report by the nine member team led by the former chief of ISRO Dr. Kasturi Rangan who submitted the report on 31st May 2019 which underwent a wide consultation process online as well as offline. The national policy and education document running to 65 pages in its very first line, opening line, very rightly observed. I am quoting from the policy document. Education is fundamental for achieving full human potential developing an equitable and just society and promoting national development, setting the stage on the vision and mission of the policy. Just I would like to make a quick observation of some of the very laudable and significant features of the national policy on education. A lofty goal to bring about two crore out of school children, dropouts and pushouts into the regular school system, thereby reducing the school dropouts. And number two, students will be more powerful, they will be more empowered, empowerment of students by their opportunity to choose the subjects they wish to learn thanks to the flexibility in curriculum suggested in the new education policy. Number three, improving governance by bringing a single regulator to look after all institutions except medical and law colleges. Four, a flip to holistic comprehensive education by envisioning the convergence of science and arts streams. Then a focus on ethics and human and constitutional values which will go a long way in the creation of an enlightened citizenship essential for deepening our democratic rules. Then expanding the scope of preschool education, basic education as our Chancellor has rightly pointed out it is the foundation of education which has to be uh, taken care of, very important. So that way the scope of foundation education, increasing the school going years from the 3 to 18 instead of the existing 16, 6 to 14, which will enable a more holistic development of children in the formative age group of 3 to 6 years and a provision of energy-filled breakfast in addition to the nutritious midday meal to help children achieve better learning outcomes as it addresses cognitive development, affective development and psychomotor development as well. As Gandhiji has rightly pointed out, education is the all-round development of mind, intellectual and emotional and psychomotor development. And the medium of instruction until at least fifth grade, preferably eighth grade, will be in regional language, mother tongue. And last but not the least, the point which I would like to highlight is the new education policy aims to increase public investment in education from the current 4.3% to 6 percentage of GDP. So it is in this backdrop we have a very right person, Professor Manishankar, to speak about a very right topic, 
the distinguished vice chancellor of bharatdasan university will deliberate on the new education policy 2020 and initiative to rejuvenate indian glory professor manishakar is a quality driven leader a leader of quality movement in higher education i should say because wherever he goes he enhances the quality of higher education he has been instrumental in putting alahappa university as number one university at the state level and one among the very best at the national level with highest nac grade a plus plus again as the vice chancellor of bharatdasan university under his dynamic leadership he elevated bharatdasan university with a grade in nac accreditation exercise and also as the second top ranking university in the recent 2020 survey and these are all illustrating examples of his uh, quality leadership and that way we are very fortunate to have a very right person to speak about a very right topic with more than 3 decades of his excellent contributions in teaching research publications and extension amazing achievements with 12 research projects completed 32 phds produced 234 research articles published with his present h index of 32 he presented 226 papers in national and international conferences so that way we have a very inspiring personality uh, to be the first spokesperson of this national webinar on behalf of all the stakeholders on behalf of all the registered participants and on behalf of the central university of tamil nadu and on my own behalf i extend you sir a very warm welcome now i call upon professor manishankar to give his address on new education policy 2020 and initiate it to rejuvenate indian glory professor manishankar thank you professor kapu marave honorable chancellor of central university of tamil nadu patma bhushan patmasri professor g patmanabhan ji and the respected and honorable acting vice chancellor of central university of tamil nadu professor karpa kumar avel distinguished dignitary speakers participants executive council members of central university of tamil nadu and faculty members staff members and brothers and sisters a pleasant good morning to all of you i am really happy to participate in this wonderful national webinar at the outset i thank the chancellor and uh, acting vice chancellor for inviting me to be the first batsman in this national webinar so the topic is uh, you, you can see the topic and uh, professor kapu kumar avel has laid a very good platform and it made me made my job a simpler one so indian glory so i have to say the ancient indian glory and i have to compare with the present one that is the uh, initial point i want to stress so in the if you look into the ancient uh, history of india we had this gurukula system guru and shishya the shishya they used to have all round education not only in the academic education but also in all round all fields including skills everything and after that the india had 15 universities in those days many of you know the tashila and uh, uh, nalanda the apart from this there was a, a sanskrit university in srinagar sarada with temple university and apart from this that 12 more universities were in india all over the world the students came to india and they enriched their knowledge so india was the pioneer in the education field so realizing this one mark twain the famous american writer entrepreneur publisher and lecturer has rightly said india is the cradle for human race the birth birthplace of human speech 
the mother of history the grandmother of legend and the great great grandmother of tradition our most valuable and most instructive materials in the history of man are treasured up in india only so that's what uh, the mark twain he has rightly pointed out this one so that much glory we got in the ancient time after that slowly uh, we were ruled by british people they introduced a new system and because of the new system our glory has slightly come down and we follow many of uh, we have modified many of the systems in the education after getting this uh, after uh, receiving independence the all the details were already given by professor karpo kumar avel and now it's the right time to change our mind right time to change our education system if we change the education system then definitely in future india will become a brave country a developed one in the world there is no doubt in it so with this motive only on 30th july 2020 the union cabinet led by prime minister sri narendra modi ji approved the new education policy 2020 paving the way for nation wide sweeping changes in school and higher education sectors so this is one of the biggest developments in india in the 21st century and this policy was formulated after having considered over 2 lakh suggestions the this policy aims at making existing education system holistic flexible and multidisciplinary for the new generations the stand out feature of the new policy is that it has taken the 2030 sustainable development goals into account and believes in transforming india into a vibrant knowledge society so the new policy aims to pave the way for transformational reforms in school and higher education systems in india a major difference between the new education policy and the, its predecessors is to establish that it is different even in the name also it is different from everything in the past everything of the past the nep allow more flexibility in higher education and renames the union human resource ministry human resource development ministry to the ministry of education many reforms have been envisaged for higher education i want to say few of them uh, before this audience and as our uh, chancellor rightly pointed out the universe universe concept has been introduced in this one so it leads to oneness the entire india one country and it leads to the youngsters will have all sorts of education systems so the current system of implementing regulating and monitoring by many agencies uh, that has been removed and it will be under one roof so by this way if we work under one roof and if we have the universe system then our future generation will experience oneness that is the major uh, part of this uh, one if we systematically this implement this policy then at the end we will have this oneness the divine concept and this policy the first objective of the policy is to devise and implement robust solution to our own problems that are in harmony with the different programs and initiatives of government of india all everybody should know, everybody will know that the government of india within this 4 to 5 4 5 years period they proposed many systems like make in india skill india startup india and the recent one is atma nirbhar india all these systems all these proposal they are taking up so this policy will enrich the knowledge as well as skill among the younger generation and they will have the all sorts of skills to have this uh, systems this policies they can implement easily and this will result in making our nation a self reliant nation in future so this policy 
stresses upon the knowledge economy in terms of promoting cultural heritage, increasing GER in higher education, aspiring more and more youth to pursue higher education, creating a pool of talented and skilled youth who aspire to build the nation and boost national economy, imbibing technology solutions and digitally empowered higher education institutions. The policy promises 6% of GDP to be spent on education. According to the National Economic Survey of 2018-19, uh, India spent only 3% of G its GDP on education. But as per the budget 2020, it is uh, rupees 99,300 crores have been allotted to education sector. That is a 4.6% increase from the previous year's budget. So since the knowledge economy is interrelated to the society, this brings, brings multitudes of socio-economic improvements, stress on vocational studies, support through funding, incubation centers, reinforced bo boosting economy through entrepreneurship, all these things are possible. So this Atma Nirbhar is a very good program that will, uh, the, all the youngsters, they can uh, go through and they can have their own industry also in, by looking into the policy. Thus, the policy promotes education as an economic booster also. And this policy envisages broad-based, multidisciplinary, holistic undergraduate education with flexible curricula, creative combination of subjects, integration of vocational education, and multiple entry and exit points with appropriate certification. So even the engineering institutions such as IITs, uh, will move towards more holistic and multidisciplinary education with more arts and humanities studies. Students of arts and humanities will aim to learn more science and all will make an effort to incorporate more vocational subjects and soft skills, all these things. By adopting this policy, we can produce a skilled human resources who are going to make our nation a knowledge center. The digitalized pedagogy and the classrooms are also proposed to build a digital India. The mandated content will focus on key concepts, ideas, applications, and problem solving. Teaching and learning will be conducted in a more interactive manner. So curriculum content will be reduced to each subject to its core essentials and make space for critical thinking and more holistic inquiry-based, discovery-based, discussion-based, and analysis-based learning. So these are all the certain areas in, in which we are lacking at present. So the new education policy paves a way for such type of improvements. So the curriculum and pedagogy of our institution must develop a deep sense of respect towards fundamental duties and the constitutional values, bonding with one's country and a conscious awareness of one's role and the responsibility in the changing world. And among several unique features of NEP 2020, one of the best provision is to grant more autonomy to educational institutions, especially those that are providing quality education. This will help regarding, this will help regarding institutions that aspire towards excellence. So, affiliation of colleges is to be based out in 15 years period and a stage where mechanism is to be established for granting gra graded autonomy to colleges. Over a period of time, it is envisaged that every college would develop into either an autonomous degree granting college or a constituent college of university. So, common norms will be in force for public and private higher education institutions which include private philanthropic partnership and capping fees within the broad regulatory framework, graded autonomy of academic, administrative, and financial institutions. This will help rewarding institutions that aspire towards excellence. The National Research Foundation, again, another uh, very, very important uh, uh, part, which is going to make uh, history in the field of education, especially in research field, a national research foundation is slated to be set up, which will be governed independently by a 
rotating board of governors consisting of the very best researchers and innovators across fields to promote and fund research in India. It has set a goal of converting all existing colleges and universities into multidisciplinary institutions by 2030. Multidisciplinary education and research universities as at par with IITs and IAMs to be set up at models of the best multidisciplinary education of global standards of the university in the country. Thus, it is planned to catalyze the quality of academic research in all the field through a new national research foundation. This shows that the well thought of uh, emphasis in the policy on nurturing creativity and critical thinking along with encouraging logical decision making and innovation in the social and education domains. And the other, uh, another initiative is the internationalization of uh, higher education institutions. The internationalization of higher education, higher education is added first time in the education policy of India. It targets on creating India as a knowledge hub, attracting foreign nationals and to promote research collaboration and student exchanges between India, Indian institutions and global institutions through organized efforts. Exchange of credits between foreign universities and home institutes will be permitted to be counted for the award of a degree in appropriation as per higher education institutions. This is a multi beneficiary significant reform that should benefit in seamless education and industrial jobs across the globe. It will also boost international business relations in not only in not only in education, but also in support services and other sectors. The passed out students would have become more aware with the Indian culture, socio-economic diversity, trade regulations, industry strength, and many more. All education institutions will be held to similar standard of audit and disclosure of a non, not for profit entry. Surpluses, if any, will be reinvested in the education system. So this will lead to curbing commercialization of education. Now we will accept that the commercialization of education is the major problem in India. So in order to curb this commercialization of education, this policy is giving a very good uh, um, guideline. So there will be transparent public disclosure of all these financial matters with the resource to grievance handling mechanism to the general public. The accreditation system developed by National Accreditation Council. So a NAC is converted to NAC, National Accreditation Council, will provide a complimentary check on the system and it will consider this as one of the key dimensions of its regulative, regulatory objective. All fees and charges set by private higher education institutions will be transparently and fully disclosed and there shall be no arbitrary increases in these fees or charges during the period of enrollment of any student, any student. This fee determining mechanism will ensure res reasonable recovery cost while ensuring that higher education discharge their social obligations. So, so many uh, new initiatives have been proposed. I have just given, on, I have given only few points of significance. So let me conclude this. Uh, this policy envisions the following key changes to the current system. Moving to, uh, towards multidisciplinary universities and colleges with more higher education institutions across India that offer medium of instruction in local or Indian languages. So every should, district should get an uh, on higher education institution a minimum or the nearby, near to the district, uh, we must have one higher education institution in future. Then moving towards a more multidisciplinary undergraduate education system. Then moving towards faculty and the institutional autonomy. Revamping curriculum, pedagogy, assessment and student support. 
reaffirming the integrity of faculty and institutional leadership positions. Then establishment of National Research Foundation. Governance of higher education institutions by independent boards having academic and administrative autonomy. Light but tight, the regulation by a single regulator for higher education. Then increased access, equity and inclusion. Thus, the new education policy 2020 is a historic effort and the first omnibus policy after 34 years and is a framework to guide the holistic development of education in the country which will rejuvenate our Indian glory. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, for the excellent what you have given to the webinar. And uh, you know, I would like to thank the audience with the, by elaborating the key initiatives of new education policy. And on behalf of all the stakeholders of the university and participants, I thank you very much. I extend our wonderful thanks to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. I'm humbled and honored at the same time to introduce the next speaker. His benchmarks are experienced and recorded in University of Mysore, Kashmir University, BS Abdur Rahman University, and Pondicherry University. He worked as visiting scientist and a professor at, in Japan, France, UK, and Ethiopia. Leadership is not about a title or designation. It is about the impact, influence, and inspiration. It is a great honor for us to have a wonderful person who creates an impact, influences his followers, and stands as an inspiration from north to south, from Kashmir to Pondicherry. I am much privileged to invite Professor Tarin sir for the next session. Please, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak on this uh, webinar. I, I thank uh, and con congratulate uh, my friend Kumarbel for doing it and and have given us an opportunity to listen to um, the great scientist, Professor Padmanabhan, uh, who is also the chancellor. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, without wasting much time, I would like to uh, directly go into what I would like to share with you. My um, understanding of the national education policy and some of the things which I feel are missing in the policy. Though my topic is on creating world-class universities, but I must first go to the uh, subject of my first love, that is pre-primary education, because I worked on this. Though I'm a scientist, I was a social worker, and I was involved in pre-primary education as early as 1976, working in the slums. I experimented on how important is the pre-primary education, and I know the importance of the, uh, the, the influence of the uh, pre-primary education on the future of somebody's personality. We all know that three to eight is the formative age of any person and whatever me and you and um, uh, Dr. Parba Nabhan is today is the impact of the pre-primary education and the formative age that he has gone through. That's how, that's my belief. So, this government has very positively recognized that and made and corrected the error of the previous education, uh, compulsory education act. That's three to uh, 14 years and he made it to, uh, no, no, five to um, six to uh, 14 years. This was corrected to uh, eight to uh, 18 years. That's a very progressive step. But one thing which is in a little worrisome is uh, the language um, the regional language and the mother tongue in the st at, at the age up to the fifth standard is little worrisome because watching the policy did not look into the multilingual cities and um, states. Uh, for example, Karnataka. Karnataka, Kannada is not necessarily the regional language. Uh, not necessarily the uh, the um, mother tongue. Now, there are people here speaking Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam, and Urdu, and that's the mother tongue. 
For example, my mother tongue is Urdu, but my regional language is Kannada. So how do we define that? And if, if you have to study in the regional la language, you have Kannada schools, which have all been closing down because there is no demand. And there are Urdu schools where I study, which are also closing down because everyone wants to go to the English school. This is a uh, problem which we are looking at. Uh, the second important uh, progressive step taken in the present policy is uh, in the graduate program. You see, graduate program really, that's a very progressive step that you have a lateral exit. I hope they had also brought in lateral entry. The lateral exit is great because one can exit at first year, second year, third year, and finally at fourth year with an honors. This system gives a dignity to a dropout. A dropout from a college is not called a dropout, but he carries a certificate with him with certain skills and he gets employed. And a fourth uh, year honors graduate is, uh, you know, it syncs with the international system of education and they can pursue higher studies either abroad or here. That's a good system uh, in the um, uh, graduate studies. Now, the th third uh, very positive thing was the abolition of uh, uh, affiliation system. In fact, abolition of affiliation system through making autonomous institutions over a period of time is a good idea. But in uh, while writing the 12th five-year plan, incidentally, I was involved as chairman of the committee which was writing the 12th plan for the edu higher education, which of course they, there was a change of the government and change. I had introduced the concept of uh, college cluster universities where instead of having, you know, there are 100 colleges in the city, you can't have 100 universities. You can as well club about eight to 10 colleges uh, as make it an university so that each college is a, is, is, an, um, uh, is a part of the university and the resources are shared. Now, I think that, but in any case, removal of the um, affiliation system is a very good step. And then establishment of the uh, National uh, uh, Research um, Foundation and uh, Central Regulatory Body. I think they are progressive, very progressive, uh, because particularly the National Regulatory uh, Body, I am saying it is progressive because now the country's state universities are suffering from multiple regulatory systems in the entire uh, country and which are so bureaucratic that they just don't allow uh, any institution to really grow. It's better to have one regulatory system than having hundreds of regulatory systems and which are different. And I, at least there is in the hands of uh, a few academicians in the regulatory body rather than uh, several bureaucrats uh, who would be uh, regulating uh, the functioning of the universities, which is the system now even in Karnataka. They have a great problem now. now Having said that, I would like to say that, you see, the education policies have to be have to be revised not only here across the world, because it is it is actually connected with the changing dynamics of the economic order, the world economic order. The education is no more for our local meeting the local needs, but it is for meeting the global needs. Now, education is for meeting the global demand for innovation, invention, and uh, discoveries. Education is not just for building our own uh, industry and um, building our uh, um, economy, but also contributing globally, because we as Indians have been well known for contributing, uh, not only to education, but also to research across the world. Um, now, that was the reason why the education policies had to be relooked and reviewed every time. There are two things, two aspects of that. One is whether we are able to uh, strengthen our education system to meet the requirement of our country and also meet the global competition in the global employment. Yes, we were doing that and we have been successful and with the present policies, and some changes 
which have been brought out, in fact, some drastic changes brought out, definitely our uh, education system will make our youth more employable, more competitive, and more globally visible. But there's another aspect of it, which I also have been speaking about and talking about, is are our institutions as innovative, as inventive, as productive in science and technology as the institutions across the world? Why did not any of the Indian universities or even institutions like IITs and the Indian Institute of Science produce a single Nobel laureate in science and technology uh, after um, uh, the C.V. Raman in the, in the country, in spite of the fact that we have got brilliant brains in the country. Why is it that the Indian institutions have not appeared on the world ranking, which many people may just dismiss it saying that this and that, but the fact is that, yes, we have to take it into consideration that why are we not on the top 10 or even 50 or even 100 of the Times Higher Education ranking or QS ranking or Shanghai ranking, whichever ranking it is. Now, while writing the 12th plan, I made a study, actually. I made a study of the world-class universities. What is it that they have that we don't have? See, funding, many other things. You see, for example, in the 11th plan, uh, if you all may remember, 44,000 crores at that time were allocated only for higher education, perhaps the highest ever. At the end of the 11th plan, do you know what happened? Only 18,000 crores were used and rest lapsed. What is the reason? So I just try to make a study on that and try to understand what is that, how are we different from the world-class universities and our, uh, and our university system. Some certain things were striking, which may, none of us must have taken note of and even the policy makers have not taken note of. They have not taken note of how important is the critical mass or criticality at a critical point in every success, whether it's a nuclear plant or it is an uh, education system. There is what is called as a critical mass. I took the campus strength of the world-class universities. I took the average of the campus strength of the Indian universities. Our average strength of the Indian university campus is 3,500. The average of the world-class university campuses is 25 to 30,000. You know the uh, density of students in Indian university campuses? We go on fighting for large campuses. We take pride saying that I have 2,000 acres of land. Hyderabad University has got 2,300 acres of land. What is the student population of Hyderabad University? It's less than 6,000. What's the student population of Mysore University? It's less than 5,000. And you can check across Tamil Nadu or anywhere in the world. So the average strength of a student population in any university here is average is 3,500. Now, the second thing is, why, how is this going to affect? I just want to give a very simple example. I, I consider the Indian institutions as just ponds and the world-class universities as oceans. What do you get if you put your net in the ponds? You get small fishes, maybe a little larger. That's good enough to feed us. The students we produce are good enough to meet our industrial and economic growth requirement. What happens if you throw your uh, net into an ocean? You get sometime a shark or a whale. That is a noble laureate. You don't have an ocean university. How important is the critical mass? That simple example tells you that as long as we do not increase and make our uh, campuses optimally used. As long as there is a large database or there's large base for selection and spikes of excellence to come out, it's very difficult to attain excellence. This is my conclusion from the study. The second study which I made was on the diversity. 
See, diversity is so important for innovation, invention, interaction. See, two conflicting minds interact together and then a spark of new idea comes. Why is there is no invention, there is no path-breaking discovery in our universities which hits the headlines globally and makes global patents going into the global products? Did we ponder on that? Because we have never realized that we have made our university all localized. Go to any university in the country, even including the central universities. That's the reason why in Pondicherry, I opened entrance tests across the country. 45 centers I opened to bring students from across the world, uh, across the country. And I, I got 70% in Pondicherry are from outside Pondicherry students. Now, this diversity index, uh, I'm sure uh, if... Uh, uh, Dr. Padmarabhan is there, he will agree with me that there are many institutions in the, uh, in the world which are ranking institutions, they have got a fixed diversity index. 30 to 40 percent is the diversity index. You should all know that our Indian students are getting admission in the reputed universities, not necessarily because of the high uh, score we have, because of the diversity index. They deny the seed to the local white man and give it to an Indian student because of diversity. That's how Chinese are going. Th 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 other people from other countries and African countries, Arab countries are coming to study in US because of the diversity index. Unless there is diversity of minds, you cannot have. That is the reason why Indian universities have never hit the headlines of the world. Oxford University is producing vaccine. Why is Indian university not producing a vaccine? unless it's a specialized laboratory. This is a point to be thought of. So, you see, in the Western countries, the brilliant ideas emanate, political thoughts emanate, economic thoughts emanate from the university. Do they emanate from our universities? No, that's because we don't have diversity. We don't have a clash of ideas. We don't interact, and therefore we don't create new knowledge. So that is the point I want to make. Now, take, for example, you see the uh, uh, jurisdiction. Have you seen, sir, have you seen in the world anywhere there is a jurisdiction for university? There is very strange in this country, you have jurisdiction for a university. A Bangalore University person applies to Mysore University, he is considered as an outside university man, and he has to apply under a quota of two seats. Have you ever heard of this? Has this policy addressed this kind of very serious issues to make this country globally competitive? We have not actually. We have not addressed that. There is nothing called jurisdiction. It's against the principle of universality of the learning system. What is uh, the uh, choice-based credit system? We have not understood that. A choice-based credit system means that you have a fixed amount of credits to be accumulated in your basket no matter from where you pick up the fruit, you pick up the best fruit from the different universities, collect it and say, here I am meeting the need, the requirement of your 80 credits and please give me the degree. Now, in the collection of the fruits, the smart student may collect it in one year and one and a half years and a dull student may, or, or a lazy student or, or some other engagement may collect it in uh, three years or four years. You don't deny him. So, a person who has collected the necessary programs and credits in one year, he should be eligible to get his master's degree. UGC has been actually foolish. They are still fixing the duration of two years for uh, MSc and two years for something and, and for three years for BSc. Where is, is it, what, then what is choice-based credit system? The program should be offered everywhere and if he is not available in Mysore, he will go to Chandigarh, he will go to Delhi, he will pick up that. That should have been the universal that should have been incorporated in this policy, which I feel is not there. There has to be freedom of mobility. There should be freedom of recruitment for students. I, I see that is the reason if you go to, and Karnataka is, not, is, is notorious in opening uh, one university in every district. So only the students of that district are found talking the same language, taking the same idea, nothing else. So there is no innovation. I'm sure it's the same in every state. The regional 
uh, regionalism has, has dominated to such an extent that you can't expect innovation without diversity. Diversity of faculty is also very important. How do you get, you see, unless you recruit, what is our recruitment rules? I'm telling practical things. If Marvel tomorrow advertises posts, don't advertise in the in Tamil paper. You advertise there also, but advertise on time uh, uh, in the nature. Advertise in uh, Scientific American. It is cheaper to advertise there than advertise in Indian papers. And do you know how many hundreds of top class scientists of the country, our, our Indian uh, children, are there without jobs there. They are all working as associates and uh, assistants and in the laboratory helping the American professors to make name and they are actually toiling. They are all willing to come back. I experimented that in when I was in um, Abdul Rahman University. I uh, advertised there. I went to Chicago. I went to uh, LA. I selected students, uh, all Indians. I brought them here and uh, started a school of life sciences. In three years, the life science uh, uh, school which I started has mobilized about 20 crores. It has got 20 patents because they are from various parts of India. They are in this diversity, how important it is. So recruitment rules are, please don't become a servant to the rules and statutes. Have the courage to change, scrap the statute, bring new statutes. I have done it, I have written it in my books and I have done it in Kashmir, I have done it in Pondicherry. Any statute does not allow you and give you the liberty. You have got the power to change the, this thing. Take it to your council and this thing. Change the statutes and ordinances to make it easier for you to interview. Get faculty from uh, abroad. And regionalism is not going to help you to create world-class universities. This aspect has to be emphasized in our policy. Autonomy is, of course, there is, everybody is talking of autonomy. Do we have the autonomy to collect funds? Do you have the autonomy to spend funds? What is, uh, please tell me what is, you see, I have grown as a research assistant to whatever I have, little I have achieved. But I have seen all through, and that's what exactly I have been trying to practice where I went, is there is a distrust between the administration and the faculty. Administration always suspects the faculty. So, it doesn't go, you see, you always, the sanctions not given. Um, number, number of questions asked, 100. Uh, objections raised, so many. Uh, accounts submitted, not accepted. And ultimately, the person doesn't get his pension because he says somebody has put a higher bill and all this. This, this is the way we suppress. This is the way we suppress the young thoughts to evolve. You see, you should, uh, if somebody is doing something wrong, you can punish him. But the point is, you must trust them. You must give them the liberties. You must give them the power to spend. You should not come in the way. I will tell you why Indian science and technology has flourished. Has anybody thought? All the scientific institutions of India, whether it is DST, DBT, um, uh, DRDO, or ICMR, or take any name, managed by whom? It is managed by the scientist. The secretary is a scientist, deputy secretary is a scientist, all education officers are scientists. Every, every person there is a scientist. That is why they are functioning today. These are all the visionary thoughts of the, those who planned this country's science and technology. Now what happens? My, I am a very strong advocate that higher education should also go into the hands of educationists. You cannot have a control you cannot, you see, the, a bureaucrat will be shifting from agriculture to, uh, to uh, medical education, medical education to some other thing, a disaster management. I mean, there is, he has no concentration. He will not have the idea. So, therefore, it is very important that education, I think the new policy which has made the central regulatory bodies, uh, if they take a lot of educationists into that, they are going to do a great job and liberate the university from the you know, very hard, uh, you, you know what happens in a university? A do, a vice chancellor does something good. There are hundred letters will go on him making allegations. The bureaucracy cannot take a decision and say that, no, look, I be know him or no. They will send it back for reaction of the report. And then this active group who starts working on against him and then see they influence it and they keep the cases alive, even the fellow after he dies. Now, these are, I mean, these are all the things which is actually hampering. Why, why are people not writing projects, you tell me? 
I have gone through that. In 1986, I got the DST project for 26 lakhs for developing high pressure reactors. And everybody said, you will, you will not get your pension if you take this project. But I took it. But I had to go through a difficult time. So therefore, sir, my submission is the new policy has many positive things. It has got many po positive measures and um, it is very ambitious, but it has not addressed the issues which makes this university, uh, our universities, world-class universities, innovative universities, universities with invention, uh, inventive potential and creating knowledge which shakes the world, creating knowledge which simply, you know, opens the eyes of the world. No, have we? No, we have not. So therefore, critical mass, diversity, liberty, autonomy, um, all these things have, and freedom to think, freedom to evolve. You know what our universities, if, if a young man comes out with a bright idea, the professor says, no, no, you put my name, then only you can submit the project. I, I went through that process. You can't publish a paper without putting the name of the guide and the, as a first. These things are going on. Give them liberty. Yeah, I mean, these are all the things, you know, it has to be brought into the policy of the uh, government. But I'm sure the various bodies which are going to take charge are going to take care of this. Um, with this uh, uh, few uh, uh, points, uh, which uh, I wanted to share with you, um, uh, I'm very happy that I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'm, I'm able to speak. I'm sorry, I, st I normally speak ex tempo and therefore I will be wavering from here to there to here. Uh, but I, I, I hope I have conveyed my uh, thoughts effectively. I hope uh, um, Dr. Padmanabhan is here because I very much wanted uh, that uh, uh, I could convey when he is here. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. None other than you would be a right choice for the topic. You enrich us with much statistics and keep the audience minds to think. You are a notable person as a person with vision. Thank you, sir, for spending your valuable time with us. Central University of Tamil Nadu, they witnessed an energetic talk from an eminent leader, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is a privilege for me to introduce a world renowned biologist, three lifetime achievement awards, three different international institutions. A person who got many awards for his research activities would be the right match to address about the paradigm shift in research and development. Let me welcome Professor K. Kucherian, former Vice Chancellor of Periyar University, for his address on. New Educational Policy 2020, a paradigm shift to research and development. Good afternoon to everybody. Our most eminent, the scientist of our country, Professor Bhatmanabhanji. My dear, the senior colleague and my mentor and leader, Professor Karpa Kumaravel, formerly the Vice Chancellor of my illustrious university, Padre Kamaraj University. My colleagues at the Vice Chancellorship and leadership in various universities and participants from the, at the various universities, national institutes, colleges, universities, uh, the, in the virtual the national webinar here, the staffs of the Central University, and then ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to compliment my senior colleague I mentioned and former leader of uh, my university. Professor uh, Dr. Kumar Vail for taking this initiative to organize this the wonderful the webinar virtually being all uh, brought into uh, a one platform. And so thanks goes to uh, Professor Karpo Kumar Vail, sir. And today I think I would like to hint some points related to the, uh, the research and development what they mentioned in the National Education Policy, NEP 2020. Uh, this is my focus of that uh, my uh, the sharing here, being a biology scientist, I would like to share that what the, the national education policy focus on the, the research on that. And we know that whether 
to accept or not the national education policy it is all in the perspectives of the everyone individual but my opinion is this necessary yes yes it is necessary and absolutely necessary for that and so whenever everything is undergoing a change why not in education too to start from the first man height glide and start from that we have we invented the first the man hot air balloon flight and then to first engine powered air flight and then first engine powered air flight uh, flight and then finally we we invented and then we have been doing a lot wonder in this space that first privately funded human space flight in the space ship so similarly every vehicle of that you could see that so everywhere now change is going on why not be is starting from the human evolution that you could see that from the chimpanzee to a, a high tech man so everything you could see that in the evolutionary way the changes are going on so similarly in the evolution in the higher education system also that is in, i mean indian education system also has been changing everywhere as the the bundle of books we carry and then now i think with the uh, the tab or anything the computer or thing and this is the stage now we have been looking for that so our classical education system has completely has been completely started from the uh, from the curricula education now to the the digital education platform now we have been doing for that so our modern education system is all based on the computer based on the online based on the the virtual mode of the seminars and that so everything in the uh, the electronic world of the the system i think completely we have been uh, changing to a scenario from the the we call it this traditional uh, the uh, the slate system to the the book system and the book system to the now the tab system so now the future of the education system is in india and is completely of the electronic world you could see here so now everything i think uh, now it is in a wheel so we have to invent reinvent the wheel and discover and discover and at last we reach to a goal of that what so disruption is the only key for that we could see that we could identify that what is in the another world we could see that so take a leap or sleep so i think we have to take i think from the book culture to the the electronic culture of that we have to jump into that so then only we can know all those so uh, so whatever the change i think we have to translate so we have we must translate the change in the the charts wherever we get and embrace the change and so here the change is inevitable for that so here the timeline on the global education policy we starts from 1990 onwards every i think uh, the set of the 10 years i think we have been changing our scenario in the indian education system we started first in 1990 with the education for all and then 2000 the same slogan that education for all and in 2015 we started lifelong learning uh, for all and then now in 2020 we are expecting for the inclusive and equitable the quality education what we required is the the quality education i think we have to compete with the global standard so what we wanted to have to promote the lifelong learning that opportunities to be all and then now we are shifting to other is the 2030 that's what the nep focuses today and we know the as mentioned by the our senior colleague tarin sir so the research in india uh, as per just i am focusing that global 36 out of the scientific workforce in india compared to other countries leading in research only is research what i am focusing now every 10000 of the persons here see you could see that the united states 79 and then united kingdom 79 russia 58 china 18 and then see the the situation of the india is we have only four even we are far below than the the kenya i think we could see that here so the research workforce in india is still behind that that's why i think the nep the task force members have been our academician peer academy members have started to work more on the the research part of this one and here i think the domestic and foreign patent applications only the awarded these only the filed filed applications in various countries you could see that india is only i think only 17 per million people per million people of that we have only uh, i mean 17 see every 10000 uh, 10 lakhs of the people we have only 17 applications filed in the the patent this is this is the situation current situation of the the global level of the statistics in the research even the r&d personnel per million people 
we have only 366 when compared to Iceland, even which is very smaller than our the geographical area, you could there we could see that 10,000 uh, more than 10,000 and see that all the other countries in the state. So the R&D personnel per million people is very high in other countries and then still we are in the comparable position is a very low. So when compared to the GDP as mentioned by Bhatnabharan sir and the GDP in the research and innovation investment uh, is I think is very very low. I, I could see that only 0.69% in India when compared to USA 2.8, then Israel 4.3 and then South Korea is 4.2 that. So realizing all this background with reference to the, the research and development, they focus more on the, the national education policy or uh, the highlights here. I would like to highlight only the, the important part uh, about all those things. Anyhow, the MHRD has focused many things in the Ministry of Education with reference to the school education and the multimedia streams. And they, I think they have focused everything from the 10 plus 2 to, I mean, change to the the other, the 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 system, they are going to introduce in the new NAP division uh, of the our uh, Indian government. So similarly, I think the other higher education system, a four degree, I mean, four year degree of the multidisciplinary bachelor program to be preferred. I think they are focusing for that. So similar way, the research also. So what we need is the uh, yeah, total top rated global universities we wanted to highlight. So that is our main prime and objective of our the NAP to be focused for that. And then this is the, the transforming curricular and the pedagogical structure that so this is the existing I mean, uh, the academic structure from 2010 onwards we have been doing all this of the, the, the 10 years plus 10 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2 year system. I think in the new academic structure we are going to have the 3 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 years of the structure in every way of the, the second, secondary stage. Uh, we have the multidisciplinary study and then in middle stage experimental learning and then in the other third stage we have the preparatory stage we call it the play discovery and actively based interactive session and then fourth last is the fifth last is the fundamental uh, the foundational stage the multi way so all together now the 21st century i think we are leading to i think taking the country to a lead position that is the vision of the nap 2020 and uh, what our prime minister has mentioned is the 3p goal of the nap i think that i think soon we are going to realize this i hope so and the personal professional practice so these are the 3p goal for that of course we have the uh, as pointed out by the our prime minister the five pillars of the self-reliant india we have to focus in the next coming years at least before 2030 the economy quantum and then infrastructure the system technology driven, the demographic should be vibrant and the demand for the utilization of the power demand and then also the, the supply of all these things. So what we require is the yeah, road map ahead for that and what we have to ask all the A. A means for ask, A for acquire, A for appraise, A for aggregate, A for apply, that assess. So these are the, the outcomes we are expecting in the the evidence-based practice we want to do highlight for that. So as come to the point, as I mentioned, the quality of the research, I think the outstanding research is a prerequisite for outstanding education development. So that will be focused according to the NAP here. Of course, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Surya Indian Committee has pointed out that many major problems currently face in the, the higher education system uh, since from the 2010 onwards, the last 10 years, one which they have mentioned about the, the focus of the specific problem related to the, the research is the lesser emphasis. Lesser emphasis on research at most universities and colleges and lack of competitive peer-reviewed research funding across the disciplines that the, the finding they, I mean, uh, they found in the, uh, the, the major problems of the research and the vision of the 2020, what they wanted to focus based on the, the constraints of the problems or issues in our the Indian subcontinent, they wanted to highlight one point here is the, the research component is the, the establishment of a national research foundation to fund for the outstanding peer-reviewed research and to actively seed research in the universities and colleges. So that is the focus for that. And so here they mentioned that what is the research. I think 
many of our senior colleagues has mentioned that the research intensive universities so those to take place greater emphasis on teaching but still conduct the significant research but we have to focus either way three more of the, the systems in the university we are going to adopt but what we required is the more focus to at least equal importance of the teaching and research and more reliable uh, and then get in the outcome based should be in the research with the the universities are having the outcome so at uh, every higher education institutions will be provided with the opportunities for what they have mentioned in the i mean uh, the policy is the internship with local industry that is most essential that's why even in from the last 20 years we have been talking about the the intent i mean the industry institution linkages and then relations with the business and then artistic crafts persons so as well as research intensives with faculty and researchers at their own or the, the higher education institution must adopt for benefit of both the students and the, the research and then also there is a paradigm shift in the four year program that also they focused uh, as part of the degree with the national education policy is the the research so here the higher education institution will have the flexibility to offer different designs of the master programs for what they have facilitated one is the a two year program with the second year will be devoted entirely to the research it is one of the welcome suggestion and who have completed the three year degree bachelor program it's a very good and the next is the the students completing a four year the bachelor program with research as a major component so there could be a one year master's program and later we can pursue and third is the there may be an integrated five year bachelor or master's program and at that from there undertaking a phd shall be required either a master degree or a four year day four year the bachelor degree that is the prerequisite for the entering into the phd program so this sort of the flexibility they were given even starting from the undergraduate they have given focus to the research so to attain this higher the highest global towards in the quality education the model public universities the model public universities with holistic and multidisciplinary education at bar with iit and iim that is the focus they mentioned in the uh, the new education policy they call us the meru and multidisciplinary education and research universities that should be set up in in the indian subcontinent so definitely this will help the the higher standards for the multidisciplinary education across the india so here the higher education uh, the institutions will focus more on setting up the the incubation center the technology development centers in research and then centers in frontier with the areas of the research more focus for that and then greater as i mentioned industry academic linkages that is almost missing here so most of the, the the western countries they have been most related to the inclusive of the uh, the industry as one component for uh, the every part of the syllabus curriculum and the learning outcomes they mentioned so here are interdisciplinary research interdisciplinary research including the humanities and social sciences are most inevitable in the higher education system so we have to make all together as i mentioned multidisciplinary that means multidisciplinary which includes science arts humanities including the traditional the english i mean uh, the, uh, the indian language systems and then in, i mean indian the heritage system everything should be undertaken and now i think during this pandemic period we have been realizing of the uh, the problems related to the infectious diseases epidemiology virology diagnostics instrumentation vaccinology and so on so here the higher education institution will develop a specific hand holding especially for the research mechanisms and competitions for promoting the, the innovation the more towards the the culture to be created among the students whether whatever may be the area of the research either in the arts or science or humanities the management science or anything even in the health sciences i think we have to give more focus for that so nine research based teaching strategies should be adopted in earlier uh, in days uh, before we used to have the research question that what they all focus on four major is the content based the contest based the methodology based and theory based and all now has been shifted to the what the now we are changing and existing and the existing changing will be have a more we need for the the teaching education program currently we need so that's why we have parallel for nine research 
best teaching strategies, starting the review and in ending with the feedback from the stakeholders, from the students, from the uh, the alumni, from the, the parents, from the society. So that is the most I mean, requested for the nine research-based teaching strategy we required currently now. We will see next that now the research is what they are focusing is, it should be in a, a symbiotic, in a symbiotic relation between teacher and researcher. Yeah, the teacher may be the, the main, the mentor, and the researcher will be either a researcher or a student. So I think we have to make it intercollated way that we have to make all the research work together. So what the research currently need focus for the student is the, the, the research should be research tutored. So here the curriculum emphasis learning is most focused. And the research based curricular emphasis students undertaking in inquiry based learning, that is most important. Then research oriented curriculum emphasis teaching processes of the, the knowledge construction is important. And finally the research led the curriculum structured around the teaching subject content is all together. So what we record is the, the teacher student, the symbiotic relations should maintain in all for the, the focus of the students. Then only we will have a focused one and students will be a, a target audience will get the, the benefit in a win-win situation. So what they require is the currently as mentioned by Professor Tarin. So we should not confine to only in India. Our students should go abroad and the abroad students should come to our Indian the laboratories and then institution to learn what we have here all that. So what they mentioned in the the new uh, the policy is the international research collaboration for which they have mentioned one system is the credit transfer. So our I mean Indian students can take some credits abroad and the institution that is a in abroad institution or the global institution. So that will be bring brought to here and acquire the credits from the what they learn from the outside of the country, especially in the research or uh, the collaboration through the student exchanges. So that credits will be acquired. Uh, from the foreign universities will be permitted. So I think they have mentioned in the new policy where are appropriate as per the requirements of the our Indian higher education institutions that will also be countered. So that also we accumulated in our credit for the benefit of the students to pursue the in the later nine day later for the, the employment and so on. So all together what they mentioned are these catalyzing the quality academic research. So that is most important. I think the quality of academic research is most important for that. I think we have also uh, emphasized that none of the 200 top universities will have the list of that except few the standalone institutes in India like IIST, IIT and so on. But I think the universities also take uh, for lead in that country. So that's why they focus, the, the new policies focus on the National Research Foundation. So this will be a robust ecosystem of research perhaps more important than ever with rapid change occurs in the world today in the area of many things like climate change, population, biotechnology, including health, and then also the recent, uh, the, uh, the advancement of the, the networking technology like machine learning, artificial intelligence, and then also the other, other, other uh, techniques and technologies here. So the development of the research, that should be uh, the mindset of the country, I think we ought to focus. I think it is addressed in the NEAP. So research and innovation, both together at education institutions should be, I mean, I mean, I mean, cultured. It should be inculcated. So we know that it is a critical point. Of course, world best university shows that the best teaching, the learning process, along with the research, I think they are taking care of the, the universities bring back, I mean, bring uh, to a higher elevation position in the, the entire world arena. So much of the, very best research in the world has occurred in multidisciplinary university settings for that. So realizing this situation, I think India has a long tradition, but of course, we need the policy should be revamped, everything only focus on the research. So uh, based on this, now the, the policy emphasize the, the establishment of a National Research Foundation and overall the, the goal of this, the NR, F is the number one to provide the reliable merit-based and equitable peer research funding. Of course, it is very important for pursuing the basic fundamental and then applied research in our country and then helping to 
to develop a cultural research, a culture, a culture of the research in the country through a suitable incentives and recognition. That is most important. And then the understanding major initiatives to seed and grow research at every state university and other public institution where the research capability is currently limited. So that is the focus they are given based on the, the NRF initiation. So the NRF will, will competitively fund to all. I think that is most important. The funding of the NRF will go to the all the universities and then government agencies and then also taking part with the industry and then private and philanthropic organization. So all together we can make it collated way that in a collaborated, concerted way, we can focus on the research and through the NRF they mentioned. So here the primary activities of the NRF will be more as I mentioned, the funding competitive as again the peer reviewed grant proposal, all types of across the countries in all disciplines. All disciplines include which includes the multidiscipline, multidiscipline area, and then we go to see, grow, and facilitate the research at every academic institution, particularly at universities and colleges, where research is currently a nascent stage. We have to, I mean, boost them uh, to get and mentoring them for the research, and then be a liaison along with this NARF, and and uh, we should be uh, uh, recognized in the entire world, in the entire uh, arena in a global recognized outstanding research and progress in the country. Of course, they have given some of the options for also uh, the earlier funding agency, agencies, I mean the extramural funding agencies like DSP, DAU, DPT, ICR, ICMR, ICHR, so on, including the University Grants Commission will function um, as such. Uh, uh, I think there won't be any disturbance to the existing system. So here the NRF will carefully even one class again, they have mentioned that this will also again carefully coordinate with other funding agencies like all these earlier set of the organizations in our country. They will ensure the synergy of the purpose to avoid the duplication of the reports. So there should not be any conflict between the, I mean, NRF uh, with the already existing the funding agency here. So the NRF will be the whole, I mean, governed body of the entire structure of the, the research and uh, the second part which I like to mention is a, the technology of use and integration. Of course, India is a global leader in the information communication, I mean technology, including the space technology. Now I think we have been focused more on the, the digital India. Next to, I think, on the Silicon Valley of the, the US, we have the Silicon Valley. We wanted to go to many Silicon Valleys uh, in our country. So what we need is the technology. So technology play an important role in the improvement of the the whole educational system, apart from the, the research, we, uh, we need to also transform some of the areas into technology driven and for that, what they mentioned is in technology, uh, for that there is autonomous bodies to be set up, we call it the National Education Technology Forum, the National Tech, I mean, Educational Technology Forum should be set up and this will facilitate the, the science and technology together for planning, assessment, administration and both for school and higher education and that also they will focus in the, the new education policy. I think it's a very good uh, uh, team and also I think welcome suggestion. So this NETF uh, definitely will provide the independent, the evidence based uh, advice to the central state government agencies on technology based the interventions. I think they'll focus and then build at intellectual and institutional capacities in education technology and what is the envisaging of the strategic trust areas in the their, their own domain in the, the technology and finally it should be articulated the new di directions for the as I mentioned research and innovation in the next coming years. So this the NETF the NETF will main a regular and authentic data for uh, the multiple sources of the input in the education technology and this will organize the uh, the focus is to organize many multiple regional national conferences the focus on the research technology and then interventions based on the uh, the meeting and collated meeting and then the discussion deliberations from the the conferences workshops and it's all will put, put together and finally it will have a the holistic to develop the national and international education technology the researchers benefit to the researchers and the partners and the the real practitioners so what we require is also is the teaching learning e-content also to be 
I mean, uh, parallelly to be developed in all the languages of the, the region, region wise in the country. So that will be uploaded in the uh, every part of that one. So what we required is the, the paradigm shift that is most important, converting educational institutions, uh, converting educational in, in universities to research laboratories, enabling more innovation and creativity. And what we required is the more of the social labs we required to suit to the need of our uh, great country. So then only we will bring our country into a top 200 universities and not only top in the education sector and also bring to the, uh, as mentioned by Darin, we will bring many laurels and credits by way of producing the many logo laureates uh, from the our Indian subcontinent. So the knowledge is power, less dissipate to build a healthy and resourceful society through the, the education and research. So re, I mean, research is the, the very much essential and uh, this focus to very much in the NAP 2020 and we will I mean going to harvest the, the real fruit of the, uh, the research outcome through the, the national education policy. So with this, I would like to thank the organizers uh, and my the mentor professor Kapo Kumar well for giving me this opportunity to share some of the uh, the strategies and plans what they have focused in the, the national education Hello. policy uh, in the research and development. Thank you, thank you, Varanda. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Your presentation makes us to rethink many aspects of research. You have given a clear picture on where we have to focus on. Definitely your inputs will serve as a task like for those who involved themselves in research and development activities, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are happy to introduce the next speaker. Professor N. V. Vargish is the Vice Chancellor of the National University of Educational Planning and Administration, New Delhi. He holds a doctorate degree in economics with specialization in educational planning. We request you, sir, to talk about your views on the new educational policy 2020. Thank you. Can I start? Yes, sir. Please, sir. Uh, you can hear me well? Is it okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, firstly, thank you very much, the Vice Chancellor, faculty members, uh, and all uh, other respected participants in the in this webinar. Thank you very much. I am very happy to know that uh, your university is organizing a seminar or a webinar. Now it is not a seminar; it's a webinar on this issue. And uh, friends, I was just talking to Arunachal University of Arunachal uh, in Arunachal Pradesh. You know, on some of the issues related to higher education. And uh, since your vice chancellor repeatedly requested me and pro vice chancellor repeatedly requested me, I agreed to come. That is why I took this slot, you know. Thank you very much for adjusting to my time because I have another session in the afternoon. So I will not be available in the afternoon, you know. Thank you very much. Friends, uh, what I'll try to do is that, you know, this is a new policy that has come. Since this is a university, as and Central University of Tamil Nadu, I will try to take into account some of the dimensions of important statements or important policy statements related to higher education. That is what I try to do in the next uh, 25 to 30 minutes. And let me just uh, start by saying that we did not have an education policy for 21 years after independence. 1947, we got independence, but our first policy came out in 1968. Then we had the second policy in 1986, and we are getting a third policy today after around 34 years of wait, waiting. And I should say that this policy has a, had a long journey, perhaps the longest journey when compared with the other policies. Why? Because we had in 2015 a committee set up that was TSR Subramanian Committee and the TSR Subramanian Committee prepared a, a large document which is around 280 or 289 pages that was put in the website. It became a, circular, a document for discussion. Then there were large scale discussions and consultations took place from the Gram Panjayat level to the block level to the district level to the state level. 
and you also find that a report that came out was substantial. However, it did not go through the whole process and become a policy document. The second effort was made when Professor Kasturingan was appointed as a chairperson of the committee. And you will find that in the, in the year 2019 onwards, there will be a lot of change that has taken place, discussions that were taking place in 2018 and 19. And a document was released on the first day of the new ministry assumed charge. You know, the new, one of the first, first responsibility of the education minister was to release the new draft policy document, which is also a very thick document around 483 pages or so. And now based on that and further consultations, a small document, a new document, which is in a 61 or 62 pages, is brought out as the policy document and the cabinet has approved it on 29th, the 30th of July. And this is the document that we are talking about. Now, when we talk about an education policy, something that is to be clearly understood is that a policy document is not uh, a legal document. It is a document of expectation, expectations. The policy is an intellectual anticipation of the future directions of development in a particular sector. When it is an education policy, it's an anticipation of things that should take place, changes that should take place in the country, in the field of education for the next uh, uh, many years. It is not for one year or two years. So therefore, many of the statements in the policy should be seen from a long-term perspective rather than seeing in a myopic way and trying to see it from the what will happen next year, what will happen this year. And many of the statements contained in the policy needs a legal status and legislative measures to implement this policy. And so, for example, if UGC is to be abolished, you, because it is mentioned in the uh, policy that there is a hecky that will be established and all these things will be merged, nobody can uh, say that, you know, UGC does not exist one tomorrow. So, for example, this policy said that uh, Ministry of Human Resource Development will be renamed as the Ministry of Education. Immediately, there was a Gazette notification that was made. Yesterday, the Gazette notification came stating that Ministry of Human Resource Development does not exist any longer. It is Ministry of Education. So, everywhere we will change to Ministry of Education. The point that I am talking about is that the process of implementation of the policy is that the policy is a statement giving the broad directions and intellectual anticipation of the future directions of change rather than seeing it as a legally binding document like any other thing. And secondly, each of the items contained in the policy document will try to, will be taken up for the legislative measures to be implemented. That is the way it will be proceeding further. Now, let me just make a quick comparison between 1968-86 policy to understand the background in which this new policy that you are talking about. The first thing that I would like to say is that one of the major contributions of 1968 policy was it brought out a unified pattern, not uniform pattern, unified structure of education in the country. What we normally know as the 10 plus 2 plus 3 system came into existence with the 1968 policy and you will find that this was the one which is existing for the last 52 years you know, in the country. 10 plus 2 plus 3 system, that is what we are used to. But this policy talks about the defense system, 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 system. So it means a lot of change, the curricular change that is required, some of the institutional arrangements that have to be made. The preschool education has to become part and parcel of the education that you are talking about, Samagra Shitra. Then you, it is part of the fundamental right, or if it is becoming part of the utilization of education process at the school level, it means a lot of change that needs to be taking place. So I am saying that the structure, this is one of the important things that you find in this policy. 1986 policy focused more on inequalities, if you read the policy. That is a change from 1968 policy. 1968 policy talked about expansion of the system and uh, not for higher education, but for the school education. But 1986 policy talked about inequalities, but they talked about inequalities to 
inequality is in access to education, not only higher education, to school education, primary education, talked about universalization of education. They talked about inequalities in access to education. But this, this document also talks about the inequalities, but there is a difference. The inequality is that this policy is talking about not only to bring children to the school, but also to bring children to, uh, to, children to learn. So it is the learning outcomes and the disparities in learning outcome becomes one of the important dimensions of this policy. You know, that is very important to note. I'll come, up, come to some of these dimensions more closely. Why this, is cha this change is taking place? This change is taking place. Say, for example, in Tamil Nadu, it, is very it will be very difficult to find students, children who are not going to school. Because most of the children are going to the primary levels of school even to the upper primary levels of school, even at the secondary level, you will find that uh, secondary level, 93.94% enrollment, even at the higher secondary level, you find that it's 84%. One of the states where you find consistently very high enrollment at the primary level, secondary level, and higher secondary level. And also you have an enrollment of 49% in terms of the enrollment in higher education. So this is a different situation. But if you go to some of the other country, other states, what you find is that enrollment at the primary level will be full. But when it comes to higher education, it is a smaller number and the GER is also smaller. The point that I am trying to make is that 1980s, we are talking about a large chunk of students or children who are outside the system. So therefore, bringing them to the system was a major concern. But today, most of the children who are in the age group are already in the school. So the question that is posed is that what happens to them once they come to the schools, once they come to the classrooms, are they learning, to what extent you are learning, etc. So for example, the studies, even in Tamil Nadu, three districts of Tamil Nadu, in uh, 19, uh, 1992-93, under the DPP, three districts were selected. And we find that when we conducted the learner achievement surveys, we found that although Tamil Nadu has succeeded in many, many respects, when it comes to the learning levels, Tamil Nadu is similar to many other states which are not so well advanced in terms of education. The national achievement surveys conducted by NCRT and also the ASAR surveys for India, not for Tamil Nadu alone, also shows that their children are not learning what they are supposed to learn, which means that the focus needs to be shifted. If majority of the people are to be benefited in a democratic country, it becomes very important that the focus is shifted from the students, uh, the, the children who are outside to those children who are inside and what happens to them. Let me also clarify that this does not mean that those children who are outside the system will not be cared for at all. There will be certain areas, even today, even in the most education advanced states, where we find that there are some children, some areas where a large number of children are not coming to the schools, the tribal areas, remote rural areas, you'll find that there the focus will be to bring the children to the school. But the major focus of the policy is in terms of learning, learning outcomes. If we talk about the higher education system, what one finds is that I'll pick up four or five issues from the higher education system with the limited time that I have at my disposal. One is that, you know, Multidisciplinary education, that is becoming one of the important dimension. Second one is the flexible pathways to learn. Third one, diversified institutional structure. Fourth one, new governance structures. And I will also touch upon internationalization that the new policy is talking about. What I'll try to do is that the remaining part of my time, I'll spend on these five areas. Let me take the one by one. One is about the multidisciplinary education. You find that there are a large number of colleges in India, or teacher training colleges, beard colleges. There are universities which are deemed to be universities, which are single subject areas. What will happen is that over a period of time, these will change substantially and most of these institutions will become multidisciplinary. It also shows that there are a large number of institutions in India, more than 40,000 colleges, and more than 1,000 universities. What it says is that this there will be a consolidation that will be taking place and the minimum strength, student strength of each college will be at least 
3000. I think this is a Herculean task. Why? Because as per the latest uh, ISHA survey, what one finds is that 16.4% of 2500 colleges are having enrollment less than 100. You see the, what the policy says and what is the reality. The policy says about 3000 students as the minimum. But we, I am talking about the 2500 colleges in India where the enrollment is less than 100. Similarly, there are 26,000 colleges in India where the enrollment is less than 5, 500. So what does it mean when you talk, talk about consolidation? What does it mean when we are trying to make it multidisciplinary organizations, institutions? It's a Herculean task that needs to be addressed. You know? But at the same time, I feel that if you talk about the number of colleges or number of higher education institutions, where one lakh population, you'll find that in states like Telangana, in states like Andhra Pradesh, in states like Maharashtra, states like uh, Tamil Nadu, etc., you'll find that the density of institutions are very high. It will be 50, 55, 60, etc. But if you go to places like uh, states like uh, Bihar, West Bengal, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Orissa, etc., you'll find that there are only very few institutions. There are 60. 55 to 60 institutions for 1 lakh population in the first category of states, whereas it is only 10, 11, 12 in Bihar, uh, West Bengal and other places that I am talking about. So there is a lot of regional disparity. What does it mean? When you are talking about a higher education system, you will find that in those areas, if the schools are or colleges are established in the rural areas, if your attempt is to bring the people from the rural areas to the colleges to favor the disadvantaged groups in the country, then you find that you cannot have a system whereby 3,000 or 2,500 students will be in one institution. So this is something that we have to take into account. What I feel is that while the policy is getting implemented, while the strategies for implementation are taking place, we will not be able to have one uniform structure from the national level we had to have consultations with the state level. We need to have consultations with the local areas, whereby we will be in a position to talk about what should be the strength, what should be the size of the institutions. A second policy dimension related to enrollment and the size of the institutions is also that the new policy talks about 50% gross enrollment ratio for higher education by the year 2035. What does that mean? And you find that 50% is a desirable goal. Why it's a desirable goal? It talks 50% is the uh, is the play is the is the number that we say that when higher education is to be universalized. Most of the developed countries in the world today has universalized. Most of the developed countries have universalized higher education and they have a gross enrollment ratio of more than 50%. In some cases, it is 60, in some cases, it is 80, in some cases, it is 95. So, therefore, it's a very aspirational target that you are putting that it should be around 50%. Uh, but it's very difficult to achieve. Why it is difficult to achieve? Say, for example, you take the case of uh, Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu has a 51% gross enrollment ratio at the higher secondary level. Uh, uh, sorry, Tamil Nadu has an 80, 84%, eight, not I made a mistake. 84% at the higher secondary level and 49% gross enrollment ratio at the higher education level. Or in other words, before the policy is announced, Tamil Nadu has achieved the target that is put in the policy. But it is very difficult to achieve this target at the national level. Why? Because there are many states where the gross enrollment ratio at the secondary level is less than 50 at the national level, the gross enrollment ratio is only 56 or 57 percent. So there are many states where you find that this gross enrollment ratio is less than 50 percent. For them to reach a transition rate of uh, 90 percent or 85 percent to reach a target of 50 percent gross enrollment ratio will not be very easy. Therefore, my submission and suggestion, so far as this target is concerned, unless <clears throat> the school education in the educationally backward localities and regions of the country, not in Kerala, not in Tamil Nadu, not in Karnataka, not in Maharashtra, 
But in the states like Bihar, UP, Rajasthan, Orissa, West Bengal, etc., unless school education development takes place, this desirable goal will remain on paper. We will not be able to translate very desirable goal into this. As I mentioned, given the regional disparities, Tamil Nadu is almost in the verge of achieving that goal before the policy has unraveled itself. But there are many states, when you are talking about the national policy, when you are talking about the national development, when you are talking about the national concerns, it becomes very important to see that which are the states where more focus needs to be provided, which are the states less focus needs to be provided. The policy talks about the flexible pathways to learning. And that is very interesting. And also important dimensions to look at it. You can have a three-year BA degree or a BSc degree. You can have a four-year BA or BSc degree. You can have one-year master's degree. And you can have two years master's degree. You can go for a doctoral study directly from after BA if you have a four-year BA with a research degree. And there is no need for an MPhil degree. So what I mean to say is that those who are at the professor level today may be finding it. I'm also a professor, so I'm not uh, putting any blame to the professors. Uh, we are used to a system for the last 20 years or 30 years. You know, you had to do BA, a BA, then you had to get, uh, you should get more than 45 or 50 percent to get admission to masters. And in the masters, you should get minimum 55 percent as per the UGC. If you want to get admission to MPhil and in at the MPhil level, you should get minimum B plus to get admission to the PhD. All these are becoming a part of the history rather than part of the future. So therefore, you find quite a lot of changes that will be taking place from this. And it's also organizational arrangements. How will you may add one more year to an existing college? First, the question is that how will you make this complex? bringing other colleges and merge other colleges and make it in the multidisciplinary institution with the 3,000 students. The second question is that if you want to add one more year to the colleges, what will happen? How this is possible? What is the extent of public investment that is necessary, etc. So therefore, I feel that there will be a lot of changes that will be taking place in terms of institutional structures to offer courses and award degrees. This is substantial change that you will find in these cases. Because what is, what is important is that the system that you are operating now, the system that is functioning now is something that is very different from the system that we have been used to. That's why I took the case of professors. We are used to a system and that system because we have to do a lot of unlearning if we want to understand new education policy. Because if you look at from our traditional framework, we will find it very difficult to understand. I'm not saying implementation. You will find it very difficult to understand the new education policy. The third dimension that I want to uh, emphasize is what I what is mentioned as the new governance structures. This is a very important change that you are talking about. And you know we see UGC chairman addressing or ICT chairman addressing big crowd etc. But they will not be, we will not be able to call them as UGC chairman or ICT chairman at a later stage because this may be for a year. Once the legislation comes and UGC disappears and the ICT disappears, it will be different. Because there are around 16 to 17 uh, regulatory bodies in higher education in India. We are trying to see that, uh, you know, uh, the, the regulatory bodies, we, everything is brought under one umbrella called higher education, it's HECI. Higher Education Council of India. So that will be the umbrella body. And this will have four verticals. And what are these verticals? One will be National Higher Education Regulatory Committee. And this will be a single point regulator for higher education. <coughs> except medical and legal education. <coughs> Which means that for the first time, initially in the 1960s and 70s, we are establishing regulatory bodies in a diversified structure, but today we are talking about a unified structure whereby we are in a position to talk about one and all the institutions under one umbrella that is called as HECI. And you find that the second element vertical in this is what we call as the meta accreditation body that is called the National Accreditation Council. Now we have a NAC located in Bangalore, but this will be giving place to one national accreditation body 
with a large number of accrediting institutions, which will be recognized by this National Accreditation Council. So, which means that we may have 25 or 30 <coughs> accrediting institutions located at the state level, and if we may find that these accrediting agencies are uh, licensed to buy, if I can use that word, is uh, recognized to buy these national accreditation bodies. Today, although we had established National Board of Accreditation in 1994, and we established National Accreditation Body NAC in 1994, it is unfortunate to find that only 33% or 34% are less than around one third of the universities and only less than 20% of the colleges are accredited today. So therefore, accreditation moving to the state level is a way of incentivizing institutions to come forward and accredit, and that will be one way of ensuring quality of higher education. So therefore, one finds that accreditation arrangements will undergo change. And it's very difficult to implement some of the policies. Say, for example, in 2015, UGC mentioned that unless you are accredited, you will not, we will not give you money. Funding will not be provided. It is linked to funding. So accreditation became mandatory arrangement to give funding. But what did you find? What is less recognized is that only 25% of the higher education institutions in this country are funded by UGC. So therefore, if UGC says that we will not give you funds, 75% of the institutions are not concerned about that. That is not an adequate incentive for going for accreditation. But this arrangement of having state level bodies or state level institutions to accredit is a new way of looking at it. I should also say that some of the states, the state councils of higher education, uh, Tamil Nadu was one of the states which was in the forefront of establishing state council of higher education after Andhra Pradesh established in 1988, because this is a follow-up to 1986 policy. So you find that some state councils of higher education will be brought into the picture and they'll be engaged more actively in higher education activities, including that of the accreditation. The third vertical is that of uh, uh, higher education finance council, financing for, uh, council, what, what they call as HEGC, Higher Education Grants Council. Today, this function is done by the University Lands Commission, so this will be separation. This will be separated. That means academic activities and academic regulatory processes, quality assurance arrangements will be separated from this to uh, a body, which will be one of the verticals, which will be dealing essentially with the financing arrangements. Then the fourth vertical is that of General Education Council, GEC. This is the one which will be framing standards, framing learning outcomes, and graduate attributes. It's very important to notice these words, learning outcomes and the graduate attributes. These are the important dimensions that this policy is trying to say. Why it is important? Let me take one minute to explain why it is. 1986 policy talked about delinking degrees from jobs because it was felt that since degrees are essential qualifications to get into the jobs, that is why there is a heavy rush for coming to higher education. If you dealing degrees from jobs, this will decline. This was the understanding in 1986. But this understanding today, this policy does not talk about linking education with employment. This policy talks about employability rather than employment of the graduates. This makes a lot of difference. So the question is that, how do we develop the skills which are necessary? How do we develop the competencies which are necessary to get into jobs, to get into these type of uh, jobs which are high pay, high, uh, higher paid jobs in the organized sector. So it makes a lot of difference the way that higher education is seen. There is some two, th two important propositions as part of this. We talk about National Skill Development Qualification Framework, NSQF, National Skill Development Qualification, sorry, National Skill Qualification Framework, NSQF, that we established in 2013. Now what you are talking about, this new policy is talking about is National Higher Education Qualification Framework. So therefore, this will define what are the skills to be developed. And in the labor market, it is not the skills that you are looking for. When you are looking for the employable graduates, what you are looking for is the competency. And what is the difference between skill and competency? 
competency is something that can be done, that can be carried out effectively with the skills that you have. The skill by itself is not the one that we are emphasizing. One is emphasizing the competencies, but to be competent, you need to pick up certain skills. And these are the employable skills that you are talking about it. And this will have a lot of implication in terms of reorganizing our curricular structure in higher education, you know. So this is a very important dimension that you are talking about. I will take up, since my, my time is coming to an end, I'll take up two issues. One is the questions that you are talking about is internationalization, and I'll end with the, the role of the state in higher education. Now, so far as internationalization is concerned, we had seen internationalization as part and parcel of the process of development in higher education. India sends the second largest number of students abroad for studies. We send around 3.05 lakh students for study abroad programs. Unfortunately, it is only 46 to 47,000 students who are coming to India. So if India has to internationalize it, it is important to see that how large, how big uh, should be the country, uh, how big should be the student community which will be coming to India, India as a destination, how can we make India as an education hub? That's a word that is used very, quite often. And how India can become an education hub? What are the factors that influences mobility of students, how to bring students? Even we have efforts to bring students by paying fellowship. Even then, the student number is not increasing. On the other hand, the number of students going abroad from India is uh, more than 3.05 lakhs, and 44 to 45% of the students are going to UK, and a good share is going to, sorry, to USA, and a good share is going to UK, and also to Australia. These three countries put together, USA, UK, and Australia, may... Uh, they account for major share of the students going abroad. You know? So this is one part. The second is that the mobility of programs. The mobility of programs, you find that if you take MOOCs, which came out in the last decade, you know, the previous decade, you find that India has the second largest enrollment in MOOCs. You know? And this is also an important point that is to be noticed that after USA, India has the second next largest number of students following MOOC courses. I'm only talking about enrollment. In MOOC courses, the difficulty is that, unlike the brick and mortar system, the number of dropouts is so high, less than 10% only complete or remain with the universities till the certification level, till the certification level, you know. So that is the change that you find. Now, the teachers used to move without any problem. Now, the major change this policy is talking about is that we never permitted the foreign institutions to come to India and establish their independent campuses, offer courses and award degrees. And if you remember, in the last decade, in the previous decade, there was a bill that was presented in the parliament and the bill could not be passed. Foreign universities bill that could not be passed and as a result of that, the bill got lapsed. So now there is an effort to rethink about India's attitude towards establishing foreign campuses of universities from abroad, you know. So we have, this will give certainly a great incentive for many foreign universities to come. But there is a rider. Any foreign university is not permitted to establish campuses in India. If they belong to the first hundred in the rankings, global rankings, only they are permitted to come and establish campuses. It also needs to be noted that many Indian institutions are having branch campuses abroad. You know that uh, many of the private institutions especially, if you go to Dubai or if you go to Doha, to many other places, <coughs> you find institutions, Amity, you will find, you will find uh, MIT, you will find uh, institutions uh, establishing campuses. If you say, for example, if you go to Mauritius, again, you'll find many Indian institutions. But we never permitted foreign institutions to come and establish the campuses here. But this is a dramatic change. Since I'm coming to the end of my session, I want to end with saying that what is the role of the state? 
we are talking about a policy. A policy is a public document and it's a document for intervention by the public authorities. What is the role of the state that is envisaged in the policy? If you look it more carefully, you'll find that the state's role as a main financier of higher education is disappearing. The state will be playing a more important role as a regulator, a providing framework, providing controlling mechanisms for quality, defining the standards, defining the outcomes, etc. But state as a major funding agency will not be the one that is envisaged in this policy. I would also like to reiterate this point. 1968 policy, we mentioned that 6% of the national income will be given for education. 1986 policy, we mentioned the same thing. And also 1920 policy, new policy that is just released, that also reiterates 6%. And this is a goal that we are repeatedly repeated in our policy documents, but we never achieved. I don't know how long it will take. We waited for 52 years to reach a target of 6% 6 of the uh, gross domestic product to be allocated to education. We had not reached. We are still in 3.8 range or 4% of the GDP. That means we have achieved only 66%. I hope in the coming years we will be in a position to achieve that. But what is more important is that the role of the state is changing substantially from a funder, a financier, to deciding or providing guidelines, deciding the structure, and deciding about the standards and defining the quality of education rather than providing to each of the higher education institutions. I would like to stop here. And if you, if you have a system of uh, questions and answers, I can take two or three questions. Sorry? I promise you that I'll stop at 1.30. I am stopping at 1.30. But if you want, if anybody wants to ask uh, some questions, I can attend it and I can be here for another 10 minutes. Hello? Can you hear me? All right. Hello. Yes, please. Yes. Hello. Sir, please one at a time. Sorry. Sir, my name is Vijay Lakshman. Hello. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Sir, my name is Vijay Lakshman from Hyderabad. Aha. Uh -huh. Sir, what I'm uh, from doubt, uh, the, all the institutions, uh, NITs, IITs are taken a uh, admission. Sir, I can, I can, I can not get required. you. All the institutions? All the institutions like uh, NITs and IITs, uh, some uh, central universities, they are given the percentage to take to the admission. Ah. That is uh, in graduation getting for 60%. Other, otherwise, your 60% is less than 60%, you are not eligible. Sir, some other students are good knowledge into the, but they are not uh, secured for uh, sixty percent. Uh, it is it any possible to have to new education policy have any sources are there, sir? I don't know whether you got your question uh, correct, correctly. If you are asking about whether the IITs and a single discipline institutions, are you talking about okay. that? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. But uh, students are admitted taken their cut off mark is sixty percent or sixty percent above. No, that is true. No, no. There are two ways of admissions regulated. Many institutions okay. in the country are uh, admissions are based on the competitive test. Say, for okay. example, my university admits okay. students for Anfield. Okay, sir. But okay, he sir. admitted based on the All India test that is conducted and interviews which are conducted. That is at the Anfield okay. and doctoral level. Say, for example, okay. Jawaharlal University conducts tests even for undergraduate level entry and master's level and PhD level. And many of the engineering institutions, IITs and other engineering institutions, they conduct examinations. Medical institutions conduct examinations. But whereas you find that the college admissions immediately after the higher secondary level is in many states, even today, based on the scores that you attain at the higher secondary level of education. So there is a difference. The only change that I can see 
is that when these pol when these institutions are becoming multidisciplinary and this will have a lot of difference in terms of the number of students and also the way in which activities are organized you know an engineer should study little bit of sociology or little bit of economics similarly a, a science uh, graduate should know little bit of humanities or social sciences that will be the way her education is organized because when you talk about liberal arts that's the meaning of higher education okay thank you sir you shared a complex thing in a simple way about the history of education policies in india Sorry? and you highlighted the salient features of uh, national education policy 2020 sir you made a clear comparison among various edu various educational policies come out various periods in india you uh -huh. make it very understandable with the word the focus shift which was uh -huh. noted by many of the participants here Uh -huh. you also mentioned the component skill and competence weightage in national education policy 2020 sir is that is and, uh, for the audience sake uh, professor vargis was responsible for designing and introducing the ie iiep masters program in education planning and management which that was noted in his history of uh, uh, history of his career yes. and he has directed several research projects published more than 20 books and research reports and nearly ah. 150 research papers in reputed journals yes. and uh, related to education planning and financial educational planning financing and higher education that's so true professor vakis have a vast knowledge and well known for his application oriented work central university of tamil nadu is much thankful for his presence here and uh, we are really proud sir to listen to your uh, uh, speech with a lot of passion and commitment towards education thank you sir thank, thank you, you so thank much. you thank you very much it was awesome my great pleasure in getting uh, an opportunity to meet all of you virtually and uh, interact with you thank you very much i think so i have another, another i have another appointment so i am just rushing can i leave yes, sir, sir thank you sir thank you sir this is professor kumar avel I personally thank you for your very valuable contribution, sir. It is because of your insistence that I agree. Otherwise, I would not have taken, taken up this. You know, I have something in the afternoon. You know, so lined up so many things today. Unfortunately, everything got uh, together. You know, today. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you, sir. <laughs> leaders are of two types: either result-oriented or relationship-oriented. But few leaders master in both results and relationship-oriented. The last speaker of the day is a standing example for that. How to introduce the man of charisma to you all? Let me proudly welcome Professor Sulokshana Shekhar, ma'am, to introduce the speaker of next session. Thank you, Dr. Sita. So it is indeed a great pleasure and an honor to welcome Professor N. Panchadhan, Vice Chancellor, Tamil Nadu Teachers Education University, Chennai. He is a very renowned personality; doesn't need any introduction. But still, I have given this uh, very sweet responsibility, so I am taking responsibility. Uh, he is a very rich; uh, he is having very rich teaching experience of more than 30 years, and he visited 59, 55 international visits, 36 countries. He has visited. And more than 500 institutions he visited and delivered uh, lectures, invited lectures. Uh, he is a visiting professor for many uh, renowned universities. A dozens of degrees for his, for his credit he is having. Very renowned speaker. He is a former registrar of Annamalai University and currently having the responsibility of the vice chancellor, Tamil Nadu Teachers Education University. So we are proud to have you with us. Thank you. Very warm welcome to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to all am i audible yes yes sir, yes, sir. and we have uh, more speaker after professor panjanathan sir this is for the information of the participants please and for me also i also got the information <laughs> uh, most uh, respected honorable padmabhushan padmanathan sir honorable vice chancellor professor karpa kumaravel sir Galaxy of Honorable Vice Chancellors, Professor Manishankar, Professor Vargi, Professor Tarin, Professor Muthu Chelvan, Muthu Chelvan, Professor Sir Subramanian, respected colleagues in uh, Tamil Nadu, teach, uh, Tamil Nadu uh, Central University, Tamil Nadu, Tiruvallur, participants, 
ladies and gentlemen. I will not uh, uh, take much of your time. Dr. Sudha is in a wonderful uh, comparer. She is doing very good comparing. She has given a hint that uh, you have one more speaker after that. And we have not taken any food. These two things uh, I have understood the right way. But my job is very easy. But uh, Dr. Sudha, if I cross my limit of 10-15 minutes, you do like this. Uh, not in my hand, but uh, on your head, you would like this. And I will stop with that, right? That is the help I want from you. My job is very easy. That uh, uh, majority of stalwarts have spoken already. As a teacher does in the end of the class, he does some summary, summarization, something like that. And I will add my opinion with that and I will summarize. I will take just 10 minutes. So if I take more time, Dr. Sudha is responsible. So once again, I congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Karpo Kumaravelji and his colleagues in the university for organizing this great program. Thanks to Government of India, Honorable Prime Minister of India, Honorable uh, Minister for Higher Education uh, and, and the Kasturi Ranganji's committee for making a very good new national education policy. There are many good points, good salient features are there, many good salient features are there which are good for uh, our nation, for its development. Academicians, researchers and others will certainly like that. Thanks to UGC for setting a circular that disseminating NEP guidelines, disseminating national education policies guidelines in every higher education institution uh, as a request or suggestion they have done. And uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Karpo Kumarwalji and his uh, uh, team, they have been doing it. I um, again congratulate all of them organizing this great program. It's not easy bringing a galaxy of uh, vice chancellors for various walk, walk of life, time management, everything. Once again, I congratulate. And about this GER, already people have spoken that I wanted to speak, but still, uh, my request is only summary I am telling GER, gross enrollment ratio in our country. In our country, we want to reach 50% in another 15 years, after 15 years, 2035. So, long way to go, though, thanks to Tamil Nadu government, it has achieved already 51%. But overall, the development should be, we all know that every state should develop. Only that, only then we can call our, uh, our country as a developed country. So the gross enrollment ratio, every child, you know, out of every 100 children up to plus two, they are coming only 26.2% they are coming for higher education, higher education. Many persons due to poverty. Many persons don't get opportunity. Many persons, the environment ecosystem is not good. Due to various reasons, yesterday, all of you in our WhatsApp, we received a boy in Karnataka who got 615 out of 625. Just to imagine, 615 out of 625. Honorable the education minister wants to congratulate him. He goes to his house. He, is, he and his team of uh, police officers and the collectors, IAS officers, could not even locate his house because it's such a small, small, very unimaginable size of very small house. Within the house, he could not even walk. Like uh, just uh, like crawling, he has to go and others should go inside. He sat on the floor and he encouraged so such a, a wonderful children are there, want to come for higher education, do wonderful researches. But uh, opportunities are not there. Thanks to new education policy or national education policy, it is going to open in the name of increasing GER to 50%. Naturally, when this goal is there, when this target is there, all of us will work towards that. That is the reason. Uh, that is the reason. Uh, uh, this dissemination of information about the NEP is organized. Again, thanks to Government of India for financial commitment. As Professor Vajis told, in the first time also 6%, second time also 6% of GDP, third time also 6% of GDP. But this time we pray and hope that the Honorable Government of India will make it possible so 6% will come so that uh, uh, our higher education will be second to none in the world, second to none in the world. Because uh, sometimes we talk about facilities, money, everything. And I, I remember in recently one of the White Sox press conference, uh, UGC, uh, AACT's vice chairman, Purima told there are, there are provisions to admit uh, 36 lakh students in engineering college. Truly speaking, 
exactly 50 percent around 18 lakh students are only admitted so remaining 18 lakh students vacancies are there you imagine how many laboratories how many classrooms private institutions may ask the teachers may go home but all other facilities but there are innumerable institutions where there are no facilities children are there students are there so out of this 18 lakh again 50 around 12 lakh students are coming out I mean, 4 lakhs drop out. Out of this 12 lakh again, only 50%, 6 lakh students are getting some employment ranging from rupees 10,000 per month to even 2 lakh per month. So this is the scenario our uh, most respected Vice Chairman Punya of uh, uh, AACT. He spoke in one of the Vice Chancellor's conferences, Jawaharlal Nehru Technology University, Andhra Pradesh. So, about the resources so financial implication financial allotment is more important then thanks again professor muthicharya very beautifully explained about the research national research foundation and for innovation innovation last year in the month of may i had an opportunity thanks to government of india deputed me to go to cambridge university as a, uh, as a student vice chancellors were my teachers four five chancellors vice chancellors are there in cambridge university they taught us we were students. Their time, whenever we go to the laboratory everywhere, what is your achievement? Tell something about Cambridge University. They speak only a single sentence. They say that, Professor Punch, see, this laboratory, has, this university has produced 108 Nobel laureates. Thank you. Do you want any other information? I told no other information is required, sir. When an university has produced 108 Nobel laureates, Thanks, sir. I will, I will start introspecting. I will learn myself. No need for further information. So that much is in single word they explain about the university. So we want to do that means naturally we need a lot of funding and more encouragement should be there for research. I remember one of my, uh, uh, my son's actually, my son's classmates, uh, immediate senior, uh, one of his uh, seniors, uh, he actually did a PhD in uh, INSEAD, uh, France and Singapore. He published only one paper in top FT financial time uh, rated journals. For this one paper, up to this January, last January before Corona, 19 universities in the world invited him to speak one hour. To speak one hour, business class tickets were given, five star hotels were given, for one hour presentation and a half an hour discussion, $5,000 were given. He, so many invitations he got, he was able to honor only 19. The reason is quality of research. Not research output, it actually uh, output based research. What the society wants. Accordingly, the research plan should be there. In that way, he was, his name is Mr. Upari from India. He was able to do that. So much emphasis has been given in the new education policy or national education policy for research. Then uh, four years integrated teacher education program. Four years integrated teacher education program. Mata, Pita, Guru, Devam. How engineering is a professional course. How the medical profession is a medical course is a professional course. How dental course is a professional course. Similarly, a teaching course or teaching program, integrated program, four years integrated program, the government of India is going to introduce that teach. Is a day one, the individual desires he is going to be a guru. The day one, because now challenges are more. In those days, we all went to guru's house to learn, guru's house. Then later in the classroom, guru, gurus and the students met. Now, gurus are going to students who home through virtual mode see it is it has gone other way around so more dynamic teachers we need for which uh, for which a four years integrated teacher education program is going to be introduced many walk of the society appreciations are there 100 percent literacy in you youth and adult see 74 percent of literacy rate we have in india today 74 percent of 1.38 billion means 40 crore people, approximately 40 crore people in India cannot write and read their own names, which is equivalent to, which is equivalent to four times of population of France or 10, 15 times of population of uh, small countries in the world, Europe and uh, Asian countries. So 
illiteracy to this extent is not a good sign for the development of any country. Only today, uh, we are all praying that uh, the neighbor should not get to Corona. The downhouse person should not get Corona. Upper house person should not get Corona. Because if they are get Corona, we also get Corona. We'll get corona. So now we say that others should not get Corona. Something like that. Literacy also, if there is an imbalance, we are all highly educated, but 40 crore people are not, are illiterate means uh, balanced development of your country cannot be seen. And again, illiteracy and poverty, they go hand in hand. Every second, see, this is one second. One second. One second, every second, a person is dying in the world due to poverty. Not that, Sudha, don't look at me because I am talking, people are dying. No, no, no. Not like that, don't look at me. But, uh, uh, the, you see, because of poverty, poverty and the literacy, they go hand in hand. So, in order to avoid poverty, in order to avoid poverty, literacy is one of the variables we all know we should establish that we should provide a new education policy. National education policy has given permission for the 100% literacy of youth and adult. So, it, it is a very good welcome feature. We should appreciate it. National book promotion policy. National book promotion policy. Even today, poor children, they go to their seniors, they request you please give your books. Go to many schools and colleges, you can see. Aka, Anna, please give your books. Please give your books because I don't have facility. I don't have facility to buy my own book. So national, national book promotion policy is going to be established. And similarly, blended method of teaching and learning. There are 150 methods of teaching. All along, we have been dominating as a teacher-dominated method. Whatever I say, whatever I speak, you should listen. Otherwise, absent, low internal mark. That is the situation in many places. Now, it is the other way around. Students will decide what he wants to learn. What is the methodology we have to adapt? There are 150 methods. Case study is a method. Game is a method. Uh, 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 the group discussion is a method. Quiz is a method. Interaction is a method. Extempo speech is a method. Seminar is a method. Conference is a method. Virtual platform is a method. 150 methods are there. Honestly speaking, are we all higher education teachers? Are we uh, uh, using all these methods? So there is going to be a, an excellent uh, arrangement that uh, National Education Technology Forum, where how teaching, learning, evaluation process will be there, uh, maybe involving inclusive of these 150 methods should be uh, brought out. The National Education Policy has got a provision for that. And autonomy, uh, much has been spoken by all of us, but uh, thanks to Professor Tarin sir. He also spoke about that uh, many people do not come forward to take research projects because of lack of autonomy. Lack of autonomy. We don't find fault with anybody. But the new education policy, national education policy 2020, highlights that more autonomy will be given to the teacher. Will be given to the teacher. So that will lead for very good quality education and research. Flexibility in studying, people spoke about it. Mobility and the credit transfers, people spoke about it. Translation center. There are excellent uh, uh, research outcomes but it is written in Hindi or it is written in English or it is written in Tamil. So in all language, there is going to be a, a very good center, translation center. The center will certainly translate all the important research outcome innovations, research outcomes and innovations in the local language. It is going to be a great advantage what is going on in the research field. Even a common man can understand that arrangement has been made for which provision has been given as one of the excellent appreciable salient features of national education policy. So the emphasis on thinking, creativity, problem solving, innovation, all these things we have been all along talking when student-centered teaching, learner-centered teaching, trainee-centered training comes to practice, only then emphasis for thinking, creativity, problem solving, innovation, all those things are possible in a big level new education policy or national education policy giving scope for all those things. I don't want to talk much about the multidisciplinary institutions. People, great uh, vice chancellors have addressed uh, the advantage of uh, multidisciplinary universities. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, it will really, uh, the university going to the university is not only learning things from curriculum, something more than that shaping the personality of an individual. The university campus is personality development laboratory, networking,
talking to different type of people, mobility, all those things will be possible because of this particular salient uh, feature or point, integration of social sciences and humanities. Even today we see in many universities and colleges, the uh, students, science students don't visit even humanities. Humanities students are afraid of science. These two people together don't visit engineering. Engineering people never enter into medical college side. Uh, so why I'm telling all those things, this integration should be there only then useful, fruitful, holistic personality will be developed in individuals and uh, outcome also, such outcome also will be very good. Liberal and holistic approach will be only then it is possible. More than 20% of uh, governance, particularly financial governance of developed uh, uh, countries like United States, United Kingdom, uh, Denmark, if you take, uh, the money comes from, fund comes from alumni, comes from alumni. But to that level in developing countries, it does not happen, particularly in India, it does not happen that much money uh, we, don't, we don't get from alumni. There are many excellent alumni are there. There are alumni who are given their properties to the institution where got, they got education. But uh, no, such a vibrant, dynamic uh, alumni associations, many institutions we do not have in India. But fortunately, in developed countries like United States, I was a short-term student in Netherlands in Bajanjan University. And I could see that many of the resources, building, including buildings, were donated by alumni association without the vice chancellor or president of the institution asking for that. Without asking for that, they donated it. So why I'm telling here is uh, there are long way to go for us, all the respected teachers and other stakeholders of the institutions, uh, maybe students, parents, uh, others. We all should work together to see that the national education policy, particularly the excellent salient features of uh, positive points, uh, which are development driven points, uh, which are uh, really will be useful to future of our country. For all those things, uh, it is not only the government of India or government of Tamil Nadu state government, but also other stakeholders should come forward to, to uh, observe all those things, share responsibility uh, wherever you feel it is positive and it is good for the country and we should implement only then as a teamwork, uh, all stakeholders, we can do that. Once again, I congratulate uh, Professor uh, Karpo Kumar Vail, sir. Whenever I congratulate, it means uh, I, I, I'm congratulating everybody. Sudha, madam, uh, it, it includes you also. Don't worry. And uh, I congratulate all of you for taking much efforts and organizing this great program. And repeatedly, when we listen to this uh, NEP from great people, from great people, naturally, it gets the reinforced in our mind. And we all come forward to share responsibility and work. And we become institution builder as a first step. Next, uh, as a nation builder, we become. So with this uh, uh, note, maybe summary, I have not given anything new point. Only I have summarized what very honorable galaxy of honorable vice chancellors delivered. So with this note, I congratulate everybody. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for listening to me. And uh, God bless all. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Sir, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And thank I you, thank you. Listen to this national webinar. On behalf of the Central University of Tamil Nadu and on my own behalf, I convey our sincere thanks to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. May I request Professor Nathajan, sir, Dean Student Welfare, to introduce Professor Sivasubramanian sir to the floor. Very good afternoon to all. So I'm very happy to introduce Professor S. Sivasubramanian. He's an eminent uh, scientist, distinguished academician, an able administrator. He served in different capacities as a head of the department of chemistry, coordinator school of chemistry, vice chancellor for Bharadiyar University, then Nurul Islam University. And uh, he had a, uh, he completed, guided 20 PhD scholars published more than 100 papers and visited many countries. With this brief introduction, I'm very happy to invite you, sir, to give a presentation. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. I'm sorry at this um, 1.56, almost, uh, I think all of you will be hungry. Let me try to 20 minutes. But the topic assigned to me is that is 
NEP 2020, a powerful tool to produce outstanding intellectuals in higher education. Surely it is a great learning for all of us. From the sessions, we listen so far, get a clear idea about the new education policy. In short, new education policy put path put path for the development in three areas: imparting knowledge, giving the right skills, developing the right attitude. All the speakers of today so far focused on knowledge, skill, and initiatives mentioned in new education policy. They also shared the objective of new education policy to build a nation with competent adults, which will in turn result in the overall development of the nation. From the presentation of the speakers, we got knowledge. From the way you all presented, we learned the role of attitude as a major criteria for success. May I request Dr. S. Bhuvaneshwari Ma, the Registrar of Central University of Tamil Nadu for a formal note of thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Madam, one minute, madam. Yes. Uh, I would like to thank just one. Madam, thanks for Professor Mukherjian, Professor Tareen, who have immensely contributed for the success of this program. And I would like to thank Professor Tareen for his very excellent and authentic presentation, which he made out of his own experience as a successful Vice Chancellor. And I am very particularly happy about Professor Muthucharian, who has uh, done a very effective presentation on uh, research and development as uh, elicited from the national policy and education. And uh, that way, we are very fortunate to have two different perspectives from two different uh, eminent uh, personalities. And uh, Professor Tareen, you know, he was a successful Vice Chancellor in the Kashmir University and uh, he has been very successful in the University of Mysore and also uh, he, I mean, um, set the trends how a central university should function in Pondicherry University during his exemplary tenure as the Vice Chancellor of Pondicherry University. So I thank you, sir, Professor Tarin, sir, for your very valuable time and for uh, sparing your precious time accepting and honoring your invitation. I am Professor Muthu Chayyan. He was a very successful Vice Chancellor of Peria University. And for your kind information, he was my colleague in Madurai Kamaraj University when I was the Vice Chancellor. And he was a syndicate member of the syndicate and a coordinator of the university with the potential for excellence. It was a golden period in which we got lot of funds from various funding agencies like UGC, DST, DBT. And we not only got the grant, we utilized the grant and we activated all domains of higher education, especially the department, the school of biology. So that way, when he became the vice chancellor of uh, Perrier University, we were very much happy about his achievements during his tenure as the vice chancellor of Perrier University. And now, for your kind information, he is working as the pro vice chancellor in a university at Bangalore. So I mean, his very busy schedules. He has honored my invitation and I am very much thankful to him on my own behalf and on behalf of the Central University of Tamil Nadu. I thank uh, Professor Varghese, Professor Panjanadam, Professor uh, Manishankar, all stalwarts and Professor Sivasubramanian also who could not conclude his presentation due to a technical snag. I once again thank one and all for your very precious time on my own behalf and on behalf of the Central University of Tamil Nadu. Now I request uh, our registrar, Professor Bhuvaneshwari, uh, to speak a few words, uh, thanking them on behalf of the CMT. Professor Kumarwell, I have to tell you that I have a lot of time because ah. I am unemployed. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So it's a part of a pleasure to have you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Professor Varavel, because of the technical problem, I could not complete. Thank you, sir. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And Professor Panjanadam, sir, I would like to speak a few words about him. Where during my tenure as the Vice Chancellor, he has contributed immensely in various capacities. I used to invite him for a number of assignments 
in selection committee meetings in scrutiny committee and as a subject expert and that way his contribution for the development of the university has been immense and anamala university he served as a successful register in a very turbulent transitional period very turbulent very transitional period and he was a very successful register and when he became the vice chancellor of the tamil nadu teacher education university i was the first person to talk to him over phone to congratulate him and to convey my best wishes and i now strongly feel that on the basis of the feedback i get from others and on my own observation the tamil nadu teacher education university is in the safe hands of a very illustrious vice chancellor and we are with you sir for all your activities in the development of the university and you are not only a very great administrator but you are a very good scholar also so that academic leadership is very important and you are an example of a combination of academic leadership and administrative leadership thank you very much sir for sparing your precious time thank, thank you, you. Sir. thanks for your blessing sir. thank you sir thank, thank you. you thank you thank you sir thank you so much i would like to extend my thanks on behalf of central university of tamil nadu so this is a great time we had with you all sir so i wholeheartedly thank our chancellor padma bhushan professor g padmanabhan sir who inaugurated today's webinar and thanks to professor mani shankar vice chancellor bharati das and university to make a very glorious presentation related to the issue and thank you sir professor tarin sir sir i am from your school from pondicherry university i don't know whether you remember me or not oh i see okay you you made me the associate professor in department of computer science and engineering oh great on your campus sir great you see yeah, i appointed you, you know i yes, appointed three, i appointed 300 people Yes, sir. Mutna Bang is me. <laughs> and hundred women. And thank you so much. I appointed hundred women. Yes, sir. <laughs> and in that too, one among is me. <laughs> so thank you, sir. Thanks for joining us, and it's so glorious to see you after a very long gap. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. It's all like a treasure hunt, right? From you, we are just hunting over. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks for sharing all your very valuable and guided experiences. Thank you. Sir Muttucharyan sir former vice chancellor Periyar University thanks for joining us sir under your great leadership right on seeing over the Periyar University glowing with all of the experiences you are sharing with us right on the platform sir thank you thank you so much and professor Siva Subramanian sir former vice chancellor Bharti R University thank you sir thank you thank you so much very much for your uh, contributions right today and professor n v vargis vice chancellor national university of educational planning and administration the right person to make over in today's platform sir thank you so much for making your contribution professor panchanathan sir vice chancellor tamil nadu teachers education university thank you sir thank you for coming and joining with us today for making this glorious presentation so it is all like making a very great thanks right from the desk of vice chancellor from the fraternity of central university of tamil nadu very heartfelt thanks to all of the participants to to make the platform very glorious and very prestigious thank you for making us joining sir thank you so much thank you thank you one and all thank you ma'am let us all raise for national anthem
जय हिंद